Frank Merrill at the altar. Frank Merrill stepped through the swing doors of the London and Western Counties Bank with a light heart and a smile in his eyes, and went straight to his chief's office. I shall want you to let me go out this afternoon for an hour, he said. Brandon looked up wearily. He had not been without his sleepless moments, and the strain of the forgery and the audit which followed was telling heavily upon him. He nodded a silent agreement, and Frank went back to his desk, humming a tune. He had every reason to be happy, for in his pocket was the special license which, for consideration, had been granted to him, and which empowered him to marry the girl whose amazing telegram had arrived that morning while he was at breakfast. It had contained only four words. Marry you today, May. He could not guess what extraordinary circumstances had induced her to take so definite a view, but he was a very contented and happy young man. She was to arrive in London soon after twelve, and he had arranged to meet her at the station and take her to lunch. Perhaps then she would explain the reason for her action. He numbered among his acquaintances the rector of a suburban church, who had agreed to perform the ceremony and to provide the necessary witnesses. It was a beaming young man that met the girl, but the smile left his face when he saw how wan and haggard she was. "'Take me somewhere,' she said quickly. "'Are you ill?' he asked anxiously. She shook her head. They had the Pall Mall restaurant to themselves, for it was too early for the regular lunchers. "'Now tell me, dear,' he said, catching her hands over the table, "'to what do I owe this wonderful decision?' "'I cannot tell you, Frank,' she said breathlessly. "'I don't want to think about it. "'All I know is that people have been beastly about you. "'I am going to do all I possibly can to make up for it.' "'She was a little hysterical and very much overwrought, "'and he decided not to press the question, "'though her words puzzled him. "'Where are you going to stay?' he asked. "'I am staying at the Savoy,' she replied. "'What am I to do?' In as few words as possible, he told her where the ceremony was to be performed, and the hour at which she must leave the hotel. "'We will take the night train for the continent,' he said. "'But your work, Frank?' He laughed. "'Oh, blow work!' he cried hilariously. "'I cannot think of work today.' At 2.15 he was waiting in the vestry for the girl's arrival, chatting with his friend the rector. He had arranged for the ceremony to be performed at 2.30, and the witnesses, a glum verger and a woman engaged in cleaning the church, sat in the pews of the empty building, waiting to earn the guinea which they had been promised. The conversation was about nothing in particular, one of those empty, purposeless exchanges of banal thought and speech characteristic of such an occasion. At 2.30, Frank looked at his watch and walked out of the church to the end of the road. There was no sign of the girl. At 2.45, he crossed to a providential tobacconist, and telephoned to the Savoy and was told that the lady had left half an hour before. She ought to be here very soon, he said to the priest. He was a little impatient, a little nervous, and terribly anxious. As the church clock struck three, the rector turned to him. I am afraid I cannot marry you today, Mr. Merrill, he said. Frank was very pale. Why not, he asked quickly. Miss Nuttall has probably been detained by the traffic or a burst tire. She will be here very shortly. The minister shook his head and hung up his white surplice in the cupboard. The law of the land, my dear Mr. Merrill, he said, does not allow weddings after three in the afternoon. You can come along tomorrow morning any time after eight. There was a tap at the door and Frank swung round. It was not the girl, but a telegraph boy. He snatched the buff envelope from the lad's hand and tore it open. It read simply, The wedding cannot take place. It was unsigned. At 2.15 that afternoon, May had passed through the vestibule of the hotel, and her foot was on the step of the taxicab when a hand fell upon her arm, and she turned in alarm to meet the searching eyes of Jasper Cole. "'Where are you off to in such a hurry, May?' She flushed and drew her arm away with a decisive gesture. "'I have nothing to say to you, Jasper,' she said coldly. "'After your horrible charge against Frank, I never want to speak to you again.' He winced a little, then smiled. At least you can be civil to an old friend, he said good-humoredly, and tell me where you are off to in such a hurry. Should she tell him? 
a moment's indecision, and then she spoke. I am going to marry Frank Merrill, she said. He nodded. I thought as much. In that case, I am coming down to the church to make a scene. He said this with a smile on his lips, but there was no mistaking the resolution which showed in the thrust of his square jaw. What do you mean, she said. Don't be absurd, Jasper. My mind is made up. I mean, he said quietly, that I have Mr. Minnett's power of attorney to act for him, and Mr. Minnett happens to be your legal guardian. You are, in point of fact, my dear May, more or less of a ward, and you cannot marry before you are twenty-one without your guardian's consent. I shall be twenty-one next week, she said defiantly. Then, smiled the other, wait till next week before you marry. There is no very pressing hurry. You force this situation upon me, said the girl hotly, and I think it is very horrid of you. I am going to marry Frank today. Under those circumstances, I must come down and forbid the marriage, and when our parson asks if there is any just cause, I shall step forward to the rails, gaily flourishing the power of attorney, and not even the most hardened parson could continue in the face of that legal instrument. It is a mandamus, a caveat, and all sorts of horrific things. Why are you doing this? she asked. Because I have no desire that you shall marry a man who was certainly a forger, and possibly a murderer said Jasper Cole calmly. I won't listen to you, she cried, and stepped into the waiting taxicab. Without a word, Jasper followed her. You can't turn me out, he said, and I know where you are going anyway, because you were giving directions to the driver when I stood behind you. You had better let me go with you. I like the suburbs. She turned and faced him swiftly. And Silver's rents? she asked. He went a shade paler. What do you know about Silver's rents, he demanded, recovering himself with an effort. She did not reply. The taxicab was halfway to its destination before the girl spoke again. Are you serious when you say you will forbid the marriage? Quite serious, he replied. So much so that I shall bring in a policeman to witness my act. The girl was nearly in tears. It is monstrous of you. Uncle wouldn't... Had you not better see your uncle? he asked. Something told her that he would keep his word. She had a horror of scenes, and worst of all, she feared the meeting of the two men under these circumstances. Suddenly she leaned forward and tapped the window, and the taxi slowed down. Tell him to go back and call at the nearest telegraph office. I want to send a wire. If it is to Mr. Frank Merrill, said Jasper smoothly, you may save yourself the trouble. I have already wired. Frank came back to London in a pardonable fury. He drove straight to the hotel, only to learn that the girl had left again with her uncle. He looked at his watch. He had still some work to do at the bank, though he had little appetite for work. Yet it was to the bank he went. He threw a glance over the counter to the table in the chair where he had sat for so long and in which he was destined never to sit again, for as he was passing behind the counter, Mr. Brandon met him. Your uncle wishes to see you, Mr. Merrill, he said gravely. Frank hesitated, then walked into the office, closing the door behind him, and he noticed that Mr. Brandon did not attempt to follow. John Minnett sat in the one easy chair and looked up heavily as Frank entered. Sit down, Frank, he said. I have a lot of things to ask you. And I have one or two things to ask you, uncle, said Frank calmly. If it is about May, you can save yourself the trouble, said the other. If it is about Mr. Rex Holland, I can give you a little information. Frank looked at him steadily. I don't quite get your meaning, sir, he said, though I gather there is something offensive behind what you have said. John Minnett twisted round in the chair and threw one leg over its padded arm. Frank, he said, I want you to be perfectly straight with me, and I'll be as perfectly straight with you. The young man made no reply. Certain facts have been brought to my attention, which leave no doubt in my mind as to the identity of the alleged Mr. Rex Holland, said John Minnett slowly. I don't relish saying this, because I have liked you, Frank, though I have sometimes stood in your way and we have not seen eye to eye together. Now I want you to come down to Eastbourne tomorrow and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with me. What do you expect I can tell you? asked Frank quietly. I want you to tell me the truth. I expect you won't said John Minnett. 
A half-smile played for a second upon Frank's lips. At any rate, he said, you are being straight with me. I don't know exactly what you are driving at, Uncle, but I gather that it is something rather unpleasant, and that somewhere in the background there is hovering an accusation against me. From the fact that you have mentioned Mr. Rex Holland or the gang which went by that name, I suppose that you are suggesting that I am an accomplice of that gentleman. I suggest more than that, said the other quickly. I suggest that you are Rex Holland. Frank laughed aloud. It is no laughing matter, said John Minnett sternly. From your point of view it is not, said Frank. But from my point of view it has certain humorous aspects, and unfortunately I am cursed with a sense of humor. I hardly know how I can go into the matter here. He looked round. For even if this is the time, it is certainly not the place. And I think I'll accept your invitation to come down to Wheeled Lodge tomorrow night. I gather you won't want to travel down with a master criminal who might at any moment take your watch and chain. I wish you would look at this matter more seriously, Frank, said John Minnett earnestly. I want to get to the truth, and any truth which exonerates you will be very welcome to me. Frank nodded. I will give you credit for that, he said. You may expect me tomorrow. May I ask you as a personal favor that you will not discuss this matter with me in the presence of your admirable secretary? I have a feeling at the back of my mind that he is at the bottom of all this. Remember that he is as likely to know about Rex Holland as I. There has been an audit at the bank, Frank went on, and I am not so stupid that I don't understand what this has meant. There has also been a certain coldness in the attitude of Brandon, and I have intercepted suspicious and meaning glances from the clerks. I shall not be surprised, therefore, if you tell me that my books are not in order. But again, I would point out to you that this is just as possible for Jasper, who has access to the bank at all hours of the day and night, to have altered them as it is for me. I hasten to add, he said with a smile, that I don't accuse Jasper. He is such a machine, and I cannot imagine him capable of so much initiative as systematically to forge checks and falsify ledgers. I merely mention Jasper because I want to emphasize the injustice of putting any man under suspicion unless you have the strongest and most convincing proof of his guilt. To declare my innocence is unnecessary from my point of view, and probably from yours also. But I declare to you, Uncle John, that I know no more about this matter than you. He stood leaning on the desk and looking down at his uncle, and John Minnett, with all his experience of men, and for all his suspicions, felt just a twinge of remorse. It was not to last long, however. I shall expect you tomorrow, he said. Frank nodded, walked out of the room and out of the bank, and twenty-four pairs of speculative eyes followed him. A few hours later, another curious scene was being enacted, this time near the town of East Grinstead. There was a lonely stretch of road across a heath, which is called for some reason Ashdown Forest. A car was drawn up on a patch of turf by the side of the heath, its owner was sitting in a little clearing out of view of the road, sipping a cup of tea which his chauffeur had made. He finished this and watched his servant take the basket. Come back to me when you have finished, he said. The man touched his hat and disappeared with the package, but returned again in a few minutes. Sit down, Feltham, said Mr. Rex Holland. I dare say you think it was rather strange of me to give you that little commission the other day, said Mr. Holland, crossing his legs and leaning back against a tree. The chauffeur smiled uncomfortably. Yes, sir, I did, he said shortly. Were you satisfied with what I gave you? asked the man. The chauffeur shuffled his feet uneasily. Quite satisfied, sir, he said. You seem a little distraught, Feltham. I mean, a little upset about something. What is it? The man coughed in embarrassed confusion. Well, sir, he began, the fact is, I don't like it. You don't like what? The five hundred pounds I gave you? No, sir, it is not that, but it was a queer thing to ask me to do, pretend to be you and send a commissioner to the bank for your money, and then get away out of London to a quiet little hole like Pilstead. So you think it was queer? The chauffeur nodded. The fact is, sir, he blurted out, I've seen the papers. The other nodded thoughtfully. I presume you mean the newspapers, and what is there in the newspapers that interests you? Mr. Holland took a gold case from his pocket, opened it languidly, and selected a cigarette. 
He was closing it when he caught the chauffeur's eye and tossed a cigarette to him. Thank you, sir, said the man. What was it you didn't like? asked Mr. Holmett again, passing a match. Well, sir, I've been in all sorts of queer places, said Felton doggedly as he puffed away at the cigarette. But I've always managed to keep clear of anything funny. Do you see what I mean? By funny, I presume you don't mean comic, said Mr. Rex Holland cheerfully. You mean dishonest, I suppose? That's right, sir, and there's no doubt that I have been in a swindle. And it's worrying me, that bank forgery case. Why, I read my own description in the paper. Beads of perspiration stood upon the little man's forehead, and there was a pathetic droop to his mouth. That is a distinction which falls to few of us, said his employer suavely. You ought to feel highly honored. And what are you going to do about it, Feltham? The man looked to left and right as though seeking some friend in need who would step forth with ready-made advice. The only thing I can do, sir, he said, is to give myself up. And give me up, too, said the other with a little laugh. Oh, no, my dear Feltham. Listen, I will tell you something. A few weeks ago I had a very promising valet chauffeur just like you. He was an admirable man, and he was also a foreigner. I believe he was a Swede. He came to me under exactly the same circumstances as you arrived, and he received exactly the same instructions as you have received, which unfortunately he did not carry out to the letter. I caught him pilfering from me a few trinkets of no great value, and instead of the foolish fellow repenting, he blurted out the one fact which I did not wish him to know, and incidentally which I did not wish anybody in the world to know. He knew who I was. He had seen me in the West End and had discovered my identity. He even sought an interview with someone to whom it would have been inconvenient to have made known my character. I promised to find him another job, but he had already decided upon changing and had cut out an advertisement from a newspaper. I parted friendly with him, wished him luck, and he went off to interview his possible employer, smoking one of my cigarettes just as you are smoking and he threw it away, I have no doubt, just as you have thrown it away when it began to taste a little bitter. Look here, said the chauffeur, and scrambled to his feet. If you try any monkey tricks with me, Mr. Holland eyed him with interest. If you try any monkey tricks with me, said the chauffeur thickly, I'll... He pitched forward on his face and lay still. Mr. Holland waited long enough to search his pockets, and then, stepping cautiously into the road, donned the chauffeur's cap and goggles and set his car running swiftly southward. End of chapter 9《A Murder》Constable Wiseman lived in the bosom of his admiring family in a small cottage on the Bexhill Road. That my father was a policeman was the proud boast of two small boys, a boast which entitled them to no small amount of respect, because P.C. Wiseman was not only honored in his own circle but throughout the village in which he dwelt. He was in the first place a town policeman, as distinct from a county policeman, though he wore the badge and uniform of the Sussex Constabulary. It was felt that a town policeman had more in common with crime, had a vaster experience, and was in consequence a more helpful adviser than a man whose duties began and ended in the patrolling of country lanes and law-abiding villages where nothing more exciting than an occasional dogfight or a charge of poaching served to fill the hiatus of constabulary life. Constable Wiseman was looked upon as a shrewd fellow, a man to whom might be brought the delicate problems which occasionally perplexed and confused the bucolic mind. He had settled the vexed question as to whether a policeman could or could not enter a house where a man was beating his wife, and had decided that such a trespass could only be committed if the lady involved should utter piercing cries of murder. He added significantly that the constable who was called upon must be the constable on duty, and not an ornament of the force who by accident was a resident in their midst. The problem of the strained chicken and the egg that is laid on alien property the point of law involved in the question as to when a servant should give notice and the date from which her notice should count, all these matters came within Constable Wiseman's purview, and were solved to the satisfaction of all who brought their little obscurities for solution. But it was in his own domestic circle that Constable Wiseman, appropriately named as all agreed, 
shone with an effulgence that was almost dazzling and was a source of irritation to the male relatives on his wife's side, one of whom had unfortunately come within the grasp of the law over a matter of a snared rabbit and was in consequence predisposed to anarchy in so far as the abolition of law and order affected the police force. Constable Wiseman sat at tea one summer evening, and about the spotless white cloth which covered the table was grouped all that Constable Wiseman might legally call his. Tea was a function, and to the younger members of the family meant just tea and bread and butter. To Constable Wiseman, they meant luxuries of a varied and costly nature. His tastes ranged from rum steak to Yarmouth bloaters, and once he had introduced a foreign delicacy, foreign to the village, which had never known before the reason for their existence, sweetbreads. The conversation, which was well sustained by Mr. Wiseman, was usually of himself, his wife being content to punctuate his autobiography with such encouraging phrases as, Dear, dear, well, whatever next? The children doing no more than ask in a whisper for more food. This they did at regular and frequent intervals, but because of their whispers they were supposed to be unheard. Constable Wiseman spoke about himself because he knew of nothing more interesting to talk about. His evening conversation usually took the form of a very full resume of his previous day's experience. He left the impression upon his wife, and glad enough she was to have such an impression, that Eastbourne was a well-conducted town mainly as a result of P.C. Wiseman's ceaseless and tireless efforts. I never had a clue yet that I never followed to the bitter end, said the preening constable. You remember when Ragged's Orchard was robbed? Who found the thieves? You did, of course. I'm sure you did, said Mrs. Wiseman, jigging her youngest on her knee, the youngest not having arrived at the age where he recognized the necessity for expressing his desires in whispers. Who caught them three card trick men after the lose races last year? went on Constable Wiseman passionately. Who has had more summonses for smoking chimneys than any other man in the force? Some people, he added as he rose heavily and took down his tunic, which hung on the wall, some people would ask for promotion, but I am perfectly satisfied. I'm not one of those ambitious sort. Why, I wouldn't know at all what to do with myself if they made me a sergeant. You deserve it anyway, said Mrs. Wiseman. I don't deserve anything I don't want, said Mr. Wiseman loftily. I've learned a few things too, but I've never made use of what's come to me officially to get me pushed along. You'll hear something in a day or two, he said mysteriously, and in high life too, in a manner of speaking, that is if you can call old minted high life, which I very much doubt. You don't say so, said Mrs. Wiseman, appropriately amazed. Her husband nodded his head. There's trouble up there, he said. From certain information I've received, there has been a big row between young Mr. Merrill and the old man, and the CID people have been down about it. What's more, he said, I could tell a thing or two. I've seen that boy look at the old man as though he'd like to kill him. You wouldn't believe it, would you? But I know, and it didn't happen so long ago either. He was always snubbing him when young Merrill was down here acting as his secretary, and as good as called him a fool in front of my face when I served him with that summons for having his lights up. You'll hear something one of these days. Constable Wiseman was an excellent prophet vague as his prophecy was. He went out of the cottage to his duty in a complacent frame of mind, which was not unusual, for Constable Wiseman was nothing if not satisfied with his fate. His complacency continued until a little after seven o'clock that evening. It so happened that Constable Wiseman, no less than every other member of the force on duty that night, had much to think about, much that was at once exciting and absorbing. It had been whispered before the evening parade that Sergeant Smith was to leave the force. There was some talk of his being dismissed, but it was clear that he had been given the opportunity of resigning, for he was still doing duty, which would not have been the case had he been forcibly removed. Sergeant Smith's mane and attitude had confirmed the rumor. Nobody was surprised, since this dour officer had been in trouble before. Twice had he been before the deputy chief constable for neglect of and being drunk while on duty. On the earlier occasions he had remarkable escapes. Some people talked of influence, but it is more likely that the man's record had helped him, 
for he was a first-class policeman with a nose for crime, absolutely fearless, and had, moreover, assisted in the capture of one or two very desperate criminals who had made their way to the south coast town. His last offense, however, was too grave to overlook. His inspector, going the rounds, had missed him, and after a search he was discovered outside a public house. It is no great crime to be found outside a public house, particularly when an officer has a fairly extensive area to cover, and in this respect he was well within the limits of that area. But it must be explained that the reason the sergeant was outside the public house was because he had challenged a fellow carouser to fight, and at the moment he was discovered he was stripped to the waist and setting about his task with rare workmanlike skill. He was also drunk. To have retained his services thereafter would have been little less than a crying scandal. There is no doubt, however, that Sergeant Smith had made a desperate attempt to use the influence behind him, and use it to its fullest extent. He had had one stormy interview with John Minnett and had planned another. Constable Wiseman, patrolling the London Road, his mind filled with the great news, was suddenly confronted with the object of his thoughts. The sergeant rode up to where the constable was standing in a professional attitude at the corner of two roads, and jumped off with the manner of a man who has an object in view. Wiseman, he said, and his voice was such as to suggest that he had been drinking again, where will you be at ten o'clock tonight? Constable Wiseman raised his eyes and thought, At ten o'clock, Sergeant, I shall be opposite the gates of the cemetery. The sergeant looked round left and right. I am going to see Mr. Minnett on a matter of business, he said, and you needn't mention the fact. I keep myself to myself, began Constable Wiseman. What I see with one eye goes out of the other, in a manner of speaking. The sergeant nodded, stepped on to his bicycle again, turned it about, and went at full speed down the gentle incline toward Weald Lodge. He made no secret of his visit, but rode through the wide gates up the gravel drive to the front of the house, rang the bell, and to the servant who answered demanded peremptorily to see Mr. Minnett. John Minnett received him in the library, where the previous interviews had taken place. Minnett waited until the servant had gone and the door was closed, and then he said, Now, Crawley, there's no sense in coming to me. I can do nothing for you. The sergeant put his helmet on the table, walked to a sideboard where a tray and decanter stood, and poured himself out a stiff dose of whiskey without invitation. John Minnett watched him without any great resentment. This was not civilized Eastbourne they were in. They were back in the old free and easy days of Guello, where men did not expect invitations to drink. Smith, or Crawley, to give him his real name, tossed down half a tumbler of neat whiskey and turned, wiping his heavy moustache with the back of his hand. "'So you can't do anything, can't you?' he mimicked. "'Well, I'm going to show you that you can, and that you will.' He put up his hand to check the words on John Minnett's lips. "'There's no sense in your putting that rough stuff over me about your being able to send me to jail, because you wouldn't do it. It doesn't suit your book, John Minnett, to go into the court and testify against me. Too many things would come out in the witness box, and you will know it. Besides, Rhodesia is a long way off.' "'I know a place which isn't so far distant,' said the other, looking up from his chair. "'A place called Felixstowe, for example.' There's another place called Cromer. I've been in consultation with a gentleman you may have heard of, a Mr. Saul Arthur Mann. Saul Arthur Mann, repeated the other slowly. I've never heard of him. You would not, but he has heard of you, said John Bennett calmly. The fact is, Crawley, there's a big bad record against you, between your serious crimes in Rhodesia and your blackmail of today. I have a few facts about you which will interest you. I know the date you came to this country, which I didn't know before, and I know how you earned your living until you found me. I know of some shares in a non-existent Rhodesian mine, which you sold to a feeble-minded gentleman at Cromer, and to a lady equally feeble-minded at Felixstowe. I've not only got the shares you sold with your signature as a director, but I have letters and receipts signed by you. It has cost me a lot of money to get them, but it is well worth it. Crawley's face was livid. He took a step toward the other, but recoiled, for at the first hint of danger, John Minnett had pulled the revolver he invariably carried. Keep just where you are, Crawley, he said. You were close enough now to be unpleasant. So you've got my record, have you? 
said the other with an oath. Tucked away with your marriage lines, I'll bet, and the certificate of birth of the kids you left to starve with their mother. Get out of here, said Minnet, with dangerous quiet. Get away while you're safe. There was something in his eye which cowed the half-drunken man, who, turning with a laugh, picked up his helmet and walked from the room. The hour was 7.35 by Constable Wiseman's watch, for, slowly patrolling back, he saw the sergeant come flying out of the gateway on his bicycle and turn down toward the town. Constable Wiseman subsequently explained that he looked at his watch because he had a regular point at which he should meet Sergeant Smith at 7.45, and he was wondering whether his superior would return. The chronology of the next three hours has been so often given in various accounts of the events which marked that evening that I may be excused if I give them in detail. A car, white with dust, turned into the stable yard of the Star Hotel Maidstone. The driver, in a dust coat and a chauffeur's cap, descended and handed over the car to a garage keeper, with instructions to clean it up and have it filled ready for him the following morning. He gave explicit instructions as to the number of tins of petrol he required to carry always and tipped the garage keeper handsomely in advance. He was described as a young man with a slight black mustache, and he was wearing his motor goggles when he went into the office of the hotel and ordered a bed and a sitting room. Therefore, his face was not seen. When his dinner was served, it was remarked by the waiter that his goggles were still on his face. He gave instructions that the whole of the dinner was to be served at once and put upon the sideboard, and that he did not wish to be disturbed until he rang the bell. When the bell rang, the waiter came to find the room empty, but from the adjoining room he received orders to have breakfast by seven o'clock the following morning. At seven o'clock, the driver of the car paid his bill, his big motor goggles still upon his face, again tipped the garage keeper handsomely, and drove his car from the yard. He turned to the right and appeared to be taking the London Road, but later in the day, as has been established, the car was seen on its way to Paddock Wood, and was later observed at Tonbridge. The driver pulled up at a little tea house half a mile from the town, ordered sandwiches and tea, which were brought to him, and which he consumed in the car. Late in the afternoon the car was seen at Uckfield, and the theory generally held was that the driver was killing time. At the wayside cottage at which he stopped for tea, it was one of those little places that invite cyclists by an ill-printed board to tarry a while and refresh themselves. He had some conversation with the tenant of the cottage, a widow. She seems to have been the usual loquacious, friendly soul who tells one without reserve her business, her troubles, and a fair sprinkling of the news of the day in the shortest possible time. I haven't seen a paper, said Rex Holland politely. It is a very curious thing that I never thought about newspapers. I can get you one, said the woman eagerly. You ought to read about that case. The dead chauffeur? asked Rex Holland interestedly, for that had been the item of general news which was foremost in the woman's conversation. Yes, sir, he was murdered in Ashdown Forest. Many's the time I've driven over there. How do you know it was a murder? She knew for many reasons. Her brother-in-law was gamekeeper to Lord Faring, and a colleague of his had been the man who had discovered the body, and it had appeared, as the good lady explained, that this same chauffeur was a man for whom the police had been searching in connection with a bank robbery about which much had appeared in the newspapers of the day previous. "'How very interesting,' said Mr. Holland, and took the paper from her hand. He read the description line by line. He learned that the police were in possession of important clues, and that they were on the track of the man who had been seen in the company of the chauffeur. Moreover, said a most indiscreet newspaper writer, the police had a photograph showing the chauffeur standing by the side of his car, and reproductions of this photograph showing the type of machine were being circulated. How very interesting, said Mr. Rex Holland again, being perfectly content in his mind for his search of the body had revealed copies of this identical picture, and the car in which he was seated was not the car which had been photographed. From this point, a mile and a half beyond Duckfield, all trace of the car and its occupant was lost. The writer has been very careful to note the exact times and to confirm those about which there was any doubt. At 9.20 on the night when Constable Wiseman had patrolled the road before Weald Lodge, and had seen Sergeant Smith flying down the road on his bicycle, 
and on the night of that day when Mr. Rex Holland had been seen at Uckfield, there arrived by the London train, which is due at Eastbourne at 9.20, Frank Merrill. The train, as a matter of fact, was three minutes late, and Frank, who had been in the latter part of the train, was one of the last of the passengers to arrive at the barrier. When he reached the barrier, he discovered that he had no railway ticket, a very ordinary and vexatious experience which travelers before now have endured. He searched in every pocket, including the pocket of the light ulster he wore, but without success. He was vexed, but he laughed because he had a strong sense of humor. I could pay for my ticket, he smiled, but I'd be hanged if I will. Inspector, you search that overcoat. The amused inspector complied while Frank again went through all his pockets. At his request, he accompanied the inspector to the latter's office, and there deposited on the table the contents of his pockets, his money, letters, and pocketbook. You're used to searching people, he said. See if you can find it. I'll swear I've got it about me somewhere. The obliging inspector felt, pro, but without success, till suddenly, with a roar of laughter, Frank cried, What a stupid ass I am! I've got it in my hat! He took off his hat, and there in the lining was a first-class ticket from London to Eastbourne. It is necessary to lay particular stress upon this incident, which had an important bearing upon subsequent events. He called a taxicab, drove to Weald Lodge, and dismissed the driver in the road. He arrived at Weald Lodge, by the testimony of the driver and by that of Constable Wiseman, whom the car had passed, at about 9.40. Mr. John Minnett at this time was alone. His suspicious nature would not allow the presence of servants in the house during the interview which he was to have with his nephew. He regarded servants as spies and eavesdroppers, and perhaps there was an excuse for his uncharitable view. At 9.50, ten minutes after Frank had entered the gates of Wheeled Lodge, a car with gleaming headlights came quickly from the opposite direction and pulled up outside the gates. P.C. Wiseman, who at this moment was less than fifty yards from the gate, saw a man descend and pass quickly into the grounds of the house. At 9.52 or 9.53, the constable, walking slowly toward the house, came abreast of the wall and, looking up, saw a light flash for a moment in one of the upper windows. He had hardly seen this when he heard two shots fired in rapid succession and a cry. Only for a moment did P.C. Wiseman hesitate. He jumped the low wall, pushed through the shrubs, and made for the side of the house from whence a flood of light fell from the open French windows of the library. He blundered into the room a pace or two, and then stopped, for the sight was one which might well arrest even an unimaginative a man as a country constable. John Minnett lay on the floor on his back, and it did not need a doctor to tell that he was dead. By his side, and almost within reach of his hand, was a revolver of a very heavy army pattern. Mechanically, the constable picked up the revolver and turned his stern face to the other occupant of the room. This is a bad business, Mr. Merrill, he found his breath to say. Frank Merrill had been leaning over his uncle as the constable entered, but now stood erect, pale, but perfectly self-possessed. I heard the shot and I came in, he said. Stay where you are, said the constable, and stepping quickly out onto the lawn, he blew his whistle long and shrilly, then returned to the room. This is a bad business, Mr. Merrill, he repeated. It is a very bad business, said the other in a low voice. Is this revolver yours? Frank shook his head. I've never seen it before, he said with emphasis. The constable thought as quickly as it was humanly possible for him to think. He had no doubt in his mind that this unhappy youth had fired the shots which had ended the life of the man on the floor. Stay here, he said again and again went out to blow his whistle. He walked this time on the lawn by the side of the drive toward the road. He had not taken half a dozen steps when he saw a dark figure of a man creeping stealthily along before him in the shade of the shrubs. In a second the constable was on him, had grasped him and swung him round, flashing his lantern into his prisoner's face. Instantly he released his hold. I, I, I beg your pardon, sergeant, he stammered. What's the matter, scowled the other. What's wrong with you, constable? Sergeant Smith's face was drawn and haggard. The policeman looked at him with open-mouthed astonishment. I didn't know it was you, he said. What's wrong? asked the other again, and his voice was cracked and unnatural. 
There's been a murder. Old minute. Shut. Sergeant Smith staggered back a pace. Good God, he said. Minute murdered? Then he did it. The young devil did it. Come and have a look, invited Wiseman, recovering his balance. I've got his nephew. No, no, I don't want to see John Minute dead. You go back. I'll bring another constable and a doctor. He stumbled blindly along the drive into the road, and Constable Wiseman went back to the house. Frank was where he had left him, save that he had seated himself and was gazing steadfastly upon the dead man. He looked up as the policeman entered. What have you done? he asked. The sergeant's gone for a doctor and another constable, said Wiseman gravely. I'm afraid it will be too late, said Frank. He is... What's that? There was a distant hammering and a faint voice calling for help. What's that? whispered Frank again. The constable strode through the open doorway to the foot of the stairs and listened. The sound came from the upper story. He ran upstairs, mounting two at a time and presently located the noise. It came from an end room, and somebody was hammering on the panels. The door was locked, but the key had been left in the lock, and this Constable Wiseman turned, flooding the dark interior with light. Come out, he said, and Jasper Cole staggered out, dazed and shaking. Somebody hit me on the head with a sandbag, he said thickly. I heard the shot. What has happened? Mr. Minute has been killed, said the policeman. Killed? He fell back against the wall, his face working. Killed, he repeated. Not killed. The constable nodded. He had found the electric switch and the passageway was illuminated. Presently, the young man mastered his emotion. Where is he? he asked, and Wiseman led the way downstairs. Jasper Cole walked into the room without a glance at Frank and bent over the dead man. For a long time, he looked at him earnestly. Then he turned to Frank. You did this, he said. I heard your voice and the shots. I heard you threaten him. Frank said nothing. He merely stared at the other, and in his eyes was a look of infinite scorn. End of chapter 10「The Case Against Frank Merrill » Mr. Saul Arthur Mann stood by the window of his office and moodily watched the traffic passing up and down this busy city street at what was the busiest hour of the day. He stood there such a long time that the girl who had sought his help thought he must have forgotten her. May was pale, and her pallor was emphasized by the black dress she wore. The terrible happening of a week before had left its impression upon her, for her it had been a week of sleepless nights, a week's anguish of mind unspeakable. Everybody had been most kind, and Jasper was as gentle as a woman. Such was the influence that he exercised over her that she did not feel any sense of resentment against him, even though she knew that he was the principal witness for the crown. He was so sincere, so honest in his sympathy, she told herself. He was so free from any bitterness against the man who he believed had killed his best friend and his most generous employer that she could not sustain the first feeling of resentment she had felt. Perhaps it was because her great sorrow overshadowed all other emotions, yet she was free to analyze her friendship with the man who was working day and night to send the man who loved her to a felon's doom. She could not understand herself, still less could she understand Jasper. She looked up again at Mr. Mann as he stood by the window, his hands clasped behind him, and as she did so he turned slowly and came back to where she sat. His usual jocund face was lugubrious and worried. I have given more thought to this matter than I have given to any other problem I have tackled, he said. I believe Mr. Merrill to be falsely accused, and I have one or two points to make to his counsel which, when they are brought forward in court, will prove beyond any doubt whatever that he was innocent. I don't believe that matters are so black against him as you think. The other side will certainly bring forward the forgery and the doctor's books to supply a motive for the murder. Inspector Nash is in charge of the case, and he promised to call here at four o'clock. He looked at his watch. It wants three minutes. Have you any suggestion to offer? She shook her head. I can floor the prosecution, Mr. Mann went on, but what I cannot do is to find the murderer for certain. It is obviously one of three men. It is either Sergeant Crawley, alias Smith, 
about whose antecedents Mr. Minnett made an inquiry, or Jasper Cole, the secretary, or... He shrugged his shoulders. It was not necessary to say who was the third suspect. There came a knock at the door, and the clerk announced Inspector Nash. That stout and stoical officer gave a non-committal nod to Mr. Mann and a smiling recognition to the girl. "'Well, you know how matters stand, Inspector,' said Mr. Mann briskly, "'and I thought I'd ask you to come here today to straighten a few things out.' "'It is rather irregular, Mr. Mann,' said the Inspector, "'but as they've no objection at headquarters, I don't mind telling you, within limits, all that I know. "'But I don't suppose I can tell you any more than you have found out for yourself.' "'Do you really think Mr. Merrill committed this crime?' asked the girl. The inspector raised his eyebrows and pursed his lips. "'It looks uncommonly like it, miss,' he said. "'We have evidence that the bank has been robbed, "'and it is almost certainly proved that Merrill had access to the books "'and was the only person in the bank "'who could have faked the figures and transferred the money "'from one account to another without being found out. "'There are still one or two doubtful points to be cleared up, "'but there is the motive.' and when you've got the motive, you are three parts on your way to finding the criminal. It isn't a straightforward case by any means, he confessed, and the more I go into it, the more puzzled I am. I don't mind telling you this frankly. I have seen Constable Wiseman, who swears that at the moment the shots were fired, he saw a light flash in the upper window. We have the statement of Mr. Cole that he was in his room, his employer having requested that he should make himself scarce when the nephew came and he tells us how somebody opened the door quietly and flashed an electric torch upon him. "'What was Cole doing in the dark?' asked Mann quickly. "'He had a headache and was lying down,' said the inspector. When he saw the light, he jumped up and made for it, and was immediately slugged. The door closed upon him and was locked. Between his leaving the bed and reaching the door, he heard Mr. Merrill's voice threatening his uncle and the shots. Immediately afterward, he was rendered insensible.' A curious story, said Saul Arthur Mann dryly. A very curious story. The girl felt an unaccountable and altogether amazing desire to defend Jasper against the innuendo in the other's tone, and it was with difficulty that she restrained herself. I don't think it is a good story, said the inspector frankly, but that is between ourselves. And then, of course, he went on, we have the remarkable behavior of Sergeant Smith. Where is he? asked Mr. Mann. The inspector shrugged his shoulders. Sergeant Smith has disappeared, he said, though I dare say we shall find him before long. He is only one. The most puzzling element of all is the fourth man concerned, the man who arrived in the motor car and who was evidently Mr. Rex Holland. We have got a very full description of him. I also have a very full description of him, said Mr. Mann quietly, but I've been unable to identify him with any of the people in my records. Anyway, it was his car. There was no doubt about that. And he was the murderer, said Mr. Mann. I've no doubt about that, nor have you. I have doubts about everything, replied the inspector diplomatically. What was in the car? asked the little man brightly. He was rapidly recovering his good humor. That I am afraid I cannot tell you, smiled the detective. Then I'll tell you said Saul Arthur Mann, and stepping up to his desk, took a memorandum from a drawer. There were two motor rugs, two hauling coats, one white, one brown. There were two sets of motor goggles. There was a package of revolver cartridges, from which six had been extracted, a leather revolver holster, a small garden trowel, and one or two other little things. Inspector Nash swore softly under his breath. I'm blessed if I know how you found all that out, he said with a little asperity in his voice. The car was not touched or searched until we came on the scene, and beyond myself and Sergeant Mannering of my department, nobody knows what the car contained. Saul Arthur Mann smiled, and it was a very happy and triumphant smile. You see, I know, he purred. That is one point in Merrill's favor. Yes, agreed the detective, and smiled. Why do you smile, Mr. Nash? asked the little man suspiciously. I was thinking of a county policeman who seems to have some extraordinary theories on the subject. Oh, you mean Wiseman, said Mann with a grin. I have interviewed that gentleman. There is a great detective lost in him, Inspector. It is lost, all right, said the detective laconically. Wiseman is very certain that Merrill committed the crime, 
and I think you were going to have a difficulty in persuading a jury that he didn't. You see, Merrill's story is that he came and saw his uncle, that they had a few minutes chat together, that his uncle suddenly had an attack of faintness, and that he went out of the room into the dining room to get a glass of water. While Merrill was in the dining room, he heard the shots and came running back, still with the glass in his hand, and saw his uncle lying on the ground. I saw the glass, which was half filled. I was also there in time to examine the dining room and see that Mr. Merrill had spilled some of the water when he was taking it from the carafe. All that part of the story is circumstantially sound. What we cannot understand, and what a jury will never understand, is how, in the very short space of time, the murderer could have gone into the room and made his escape again. The French windows were open, said Mr. Mann. All the evidence that we have is to this effect including the evidence of P.C. Wiseman. In those circumstances, how comes it that the constable, who, when he heard the shot, made straight for the room, did not meet the murderer escaping? He saw nobody in the grounds. Except Sergeant Smith, or Crawley, interspersed Saul Arthur Mann readily. I have reason to believe, and indeed reason to know, that Sergeant Smith, or Crawley, had a motive for being in the house. I supplied Mr. Minnett, who was a client of mine, with certain documents, and those documents were in a safe in his bedroom. What is more likely than that this Crawley, to whom it was vitally necessary that the documents in question should be recovered, should have entered the house in search of those documents? I don't mind telling you that they related to a fraud of which he was the author, and they were in themselves all the proof which the police would require to obtain a conviction against him. He was obviously the man who struck down Mr. Cole and whose light the constable saw flashing in the upper window. In that case, he cannot have been the murderer, said the detective quickly, because the shots were fired while he was still in the room. They were almost simultaneous with the appearance of the flash at the upper window. Hmm, said Saul Arthur Mann, for the moment nonplussed. The more you go into this matter, the more complicated does it become, said the police officer, with a shake of his head and to my mind the clearer is the case against Merrill. With this reservation, interrupted the other, that you have to account for the movements of Mr. Rex Holland, who comes on the scene ten minutes after Frank Merrill arrives and who leaves his car. He leaves his car for a very excellent reason, he went on. Sergeant Smith, who runs away to get assistance, meets two men of the Sussex Constabulary, hurrying in response to Wiseman's whistle. One of them stands by the car, and the other comes into the house. It was, therefore, impossible for the murderer to make use of the car. Here is another point that would have you explain. He had hoisted himself on the edge of his desk and sat, an amusing little figure, his legs swinging a foot from the ground. The revolver used was a big Webley, not an easy thing to carry or conceal about your person, and undoubtedly brought to the scene of the crime by the man in the car. You will say that Merrill, who wore an overcoat, might have easily brought it in his pocket, but the absolute proof that that could not have been the case is that on his arrival by train from London, Mr. Merrill lost his ticket and very carefully searched himself, a railway inspector assisting, to discover the bit of pasteboard. He turned out everything he had in his pocket in the inspector's presence, and his overcoat, the only place where he could have concealed such a heavy weapon, was searched by the inspector himself. The detective nodded. It is a very difficult case, he agreed, and one in which I have no great heart. For, to be absolutely honest, my views are that while it might have been Merrill, the balance of proof is that it was not. That is, of course, my unofficial view, and I shall work pretty hard to secure a conviction. I am sure you will, said Mr. Mann heartily. Must the case go into the court? asked the girl anxiously. There is no other way for it, replied the officer. You see, we have arrested him, and unless something turns up, the magistrate must commit him for trial on the evidence we have secured. Poor Frank, she said softly. It is rough on him, if he is innocent, agreed Nash, but it is lucky for him if he's guilty. My experience of crime and criminals is that it is generally the obvious man who commits that crime. Only once in fifty years is he innocent, whether he is acquitted or whether he is found guilty. He offered his hand to Mr. Mann. I'll be getting along now, sir, he said. The commissioner asked me to give you all the assistance I possibly could, and I hope I have done so. 
What are you doing in the case of Jasper Cole? asked Mann quickly. The detective smiled. You ought to know, sir, he said, and was amused at his own little joke. Well, young lady, said Mann, turning to the girl, after the detective had gone, I think you know how matters stand. Nash suspects Cole. Jasper, she said in shocked surprise. Jasper, he repeated. But that is impossible. He was locked in his room. That doesn't make it impossible. I know of fourteen distinct cases of men who committed crimes and were able to lock themselves in their rooms, leaving the key outside. There was a case of Henry Burton, coiner. There was William Francis Rector, who killed a warder while in prison and locked the cell upon himself from the inside. There was... But there, why should I bother you with instances? That kind of trick is common enough. No, he said, it is the motive that we have to find. Do you still want me to go with you tomorrow, Miss Nutto? he asked. I should be very glad if you would, she said earnestly. Poor dear uncle. I didn't think I could ever enter the house again. I can relieve your mind about that, he said. The will is not to be read in the house. Mr. Minnis' lawyers have arranged for the reading at their offices in Lincoln's Inn Fields. I have the address here somewhere. He fumbled in his pocket and took out a card. Power Commons and Co., he read, 194 Lincoln's Inn Fields. I will meet you there at three o'clock. He rumpled his untidy hair with an embarrassed laugh. I seem to have drifted into the position of guardian to you, young lady, he said. I can't say that it is an unpleasant task, although it is a great responsibility. You have been splendid, Mr. Mann, she said warmly, and I shall never forget all you have done for me. Somehow I feel that Frank will get off, and I hope, I pray, that it will not be a Jasper's expense. He looked at her in surprise and disappointment. I thought, he stopped. You thought I was engaged to Frank, and so I am, she said with heightened color. But Jasper is... I hardly know how to put it. I see, said Mr. Mann, though if the truth be told, he saw nothing which enlightened him. Punctually at three o'clock the next afternoon, they walked up the steps of the lawyer's office together. Jasper Cole was already there, and to Mr. Mann's surprise, so also was Inspector Nash, who explained his presence in a few words. There may be something in the will which will open a new viewpoint, he said. Mr. Power, the solicitor, an elderly man, inclined to rotundity, was introduced, and taking his position before the fireplace, opened the proceedings with an expression of regret as to the circumstances which had brought them together. The will of my late client, he said, was not drawn up by me. It is written in Mr. Minnett's handwriting, and revokes the only other will, one which was prepared some four years ago, and which made provisions rather different to those in the present instrument. This will, he took a single sheet of paper out of an envelope, was made last year and was witnessed by Thomas Wellington Crawley. He adjusted his pince nez and examined the signature, late trooper of the Matabella Land Mounted Police, and by George Worrell, who was Mr. Minnis Butler at the time. Worrell died in the Eastbourne Hospital in the spring of this year. There was a deep silence. Saul Arthur Mann's face was eagerly thrust forward, his head turned slightly to one side. Inspector Nash showed an unusual amount of interest. Both men had the same thought, a new will, witnessed by two people, one of whom was dead, and the other a fugitive from justice. What did this will contain? It was the briefest of documents. To his ward he left the sum of two hundred thousand pounds, a provision which was also made in the previous will, I might add, said the lawyer, and to this he added all his shares in the Guello Deep. To his nephew, Francis Merrill, he left twenty thousand pounds. The lawyer paused and looked round the little circle and then continued. The residue of my property, movable and immovable, all my furniture, leases, shares, cash at bankers, and all interests whatsoever, I bequeath to Jasper Cole, so called, who is at present my secretary and confidential agent. The detective and Saul Arthur Mann exchanged glances, and Nash's lips moved. How is that for a motive? he whispered. End of chapter 11 The Trial of Frank Merrill The trial of Frank Merrill on the charge that he did on the 28th day of June 
in the year of our Lord 1900, willfully and wickedly kill and slay by a pistol shot John Minnett, was the sensation of a season which was unusually prolific in murder trials. The trial took place at the Lewes Assizes in a crowded courtroom, and lasted, as we know, for sixteen days, five days of which were given to the examination-in-chief and the cross-examination of the accountants who had gone into the books of the bank. The prosecution endeavored to establish the fact that no other person but Frank Merrill could have access to the books, and that therefore no other person could have falsified them or manipulated the transfer of monies. It cannot be said that the prosecution had wholly succeeded, for when Brandon, the bank manager, was put into the witness box, he was compelled to admit that not only Frank, but he himself and Jasper Cole were in a position to reach the books. The opening speech for the Crown had been a masterly one, but that there were many weak points in the evidence and in the assumptions which the prosecution drew was evident to the merest tyro. Sir John Murphy Jackson, the Attorney General, who prosecuted, attempted to dispose summarily of certain conflictions, and it had to be confessed that his explanations were very plausible. The defense will tell us, he said, in that shrill clarion tone of his which made to quake the hearts of so many hostile witnesses, that we have not accounted for the fourth man who drove up in his car ten minutes after Merrill had entered the house and disappeared, but I am going to tell you my theory of that incident. Merrill had an accomplice who was not in custody, and that accomplice was Rex Holland. Merrill had planned and prepared this murder, because from some statement which his uncle had made he believed that not only was his whole future dependent upon destroying his benefactor and silencing forever the one man who knew the extent of his villainy, but he had in his cold, shrewd way accurately foreseen the exact consequence of such a shooting. It was a big criminal's big idea. He foresaw this trial, he said impressively. He foresaw, gentlemen of the jury, his acquittal at your hands. He foresaw a reaction which would not only give him the woman he professes to love, but in consequence place in his hands the disposal of her considerable fortune. Why should he shoot John Minnett, you may ask, and I reply to that question with another. What would have happened had he not shot his uncle? He would have been a ruined man. The doors of his uncle's house would have been closed to him. The legacy would have been revoked. The marriage for which he had planned so long would have been an unrealized dream. He knew the extent of the fortune which was coming to Miss Nuttall. Mr. Minnett made two wills, in both of which he left an identical sum to his ward. The first of these, revoked by the second and containing the same provision, was witnessed by the man in the dock. He knew, too, that the Rhodesian gold mine, the shares of which were held by John Minnett on the girl's behalf, was likely to prove a very rich proposition, and I suggest that the information coming to him as Mr. Minnett's secretary he deliberately suppressed that information for his own purpose. What had he to gain? I ask you to believe that if he is acquitted, he will have achieved all that he ever hoped to achieve. There was a little murmur in the court. Frank Merrill, leaning on the ledge of the dock, looked down at the girl in the body of the court, and their eyes met. He saw the indignation in her face and nodded with a little smile then turned again to the council with that eager, half-quizzical look of interest which the girl had so often seen upon his handsome face. Much will be made, in the course of this trial, of the presence of another man, and the defense will endeavor to secure capital out of the fact that the man Crawley, who it was suggested was in the house for an improper purpose, has not been discovered. As to the fourth man, the driver of the motor car, there seems little doubt that he was an accomplice of Merrill. This mysterious Rex Holland, who has been identified by Mrs. Totney of Uckfield, spent the whole of the day wandering about Sussex, obviously having one plan in his mind, which was to arrive at Mr. Minnis's house at the same time as his confederate. You will have the taxi driver's evidence that when Merrill stepped down, after being driven from the station, he looked left and right, as though he were expecting somebody. The plan to some extent miscarried. The accomplice arrived ten minutes too late. On some pretext or other, Merrill probably left the room. I suggest that he did not go into the dining room, but that he went out into the garden and was met by his accomplice, who handed him the weapon with which this crime was committed. 
It may be asked by the defense why the accomplice, who was presumably Rex Holland, did not himself commit the crime. I could offer two or three alternative suggestions, all of which are feasible. The deceased man was shot at close quarters and was found in such an attitude as to suggest that he was wholly unprepared for the attack. We know that he was in some fear and that he invariably went armed, yet it is fairly certain that he made no attempt to draw his weapon, which he certainly would have done had he been suddenly confronted by an armed stranger. I do not pretend that I am explaining the strange relationship between Merrill and this mysterious forger. Merrill is the only man who has seen him and has given a vague and somewhat confused description of him. He was a man with a short, close-clipped beard, is Merrill's description. The woman who served him with tea near Uckfield describes him as a youngish man with a dark mustache, but otherwise clean-shaven. There is no reason, of course, why he should not have removed his beard, but as against that suggestion we will call evidence to prove that the man seen driving with the murder chauffeur was invariably a man with a mustache and no beard so that the balance of probability is on the side of the supposition that Merrill is not telling the truth. An unknown client with a large deposit at his bank would not be likely constantly to alter his appearance. If he were a criminal, as we know him to be, there would be another reason why he should not excite suspicion in this way. His address covered the greater part of a day, but he returned to the scene in the garden to the supposed meeting of the two men and to the murder. Saw Arthur Mann sitting with Frank's solicitor scratched his nose and grinned. I have never heard a more ingenious piece of reconstruction, he said, though of course the whole thing is palpably absurd. As a theory it was no doubt excellent, but men are not sentenced to death on theories, however ingenious they may be. Probably nobody in the court so completely admired the ingenuity as the man most affected. At the lunch interval on the day on which this theory was put forward, he met a solicitor and Saul Arthur Mann in the bare room in which such interviews are permitted. It was really fascinating to hear him, said Frank, as he sipped the cup of tea which they had brought him. I almost began to believe that I had committed the murder. But isn't it rather alarming? Will the jury take the same view, he asked, a little troubled. The solicitor shook his head. Unsupported theories of that sort do not go well with juries, and of course the whole story is so flimsy and so improbable that it will go for no more than a piece of clever reasoning. Did anybody see you at the railway station? Frank shook his head. I suppose hundreds of people saw me, but would hardly remember me. Was there anyone on the train who knew you? No, said Frank after a moment's thought. There were six people in my carriage until we got to Luz, but I think I told you that and you have not succeeded in tracing any of them. It is most difficult to get into touch with those people, said the lawyer. Think of the scores of people one travels with, without ever remembering what they looked like or how they were dressed. If you had been a woman, traveling with women, every one of your five fellow passengers would have remembered you and would have recalled your hat. Frank laughed. There are certain advantages in being a man, he said. How do you think the case is going? They have offered no evidence yet. I think you will agree, Mr. Mann, he said respectfully, for Saul Arthur Mann was a power in legal circles. None at all, the little fellow agreed. Frank recalled the first day he had seen him, with his hat perched on the back of his head and his shabby, genteel exterior. Oh, by Jove, he said, I suppose they will be trying to fasten the death of that man upon me that we saw in Gray Square. Saul Arthur Mann nodded. They have not put that in the indictment, he said, nor the case of the chauffeur. You see, your conviction will rest entirely upon this present charge, and both the other matters are subsidiary. Frank walked thoughtfully up and down the room, his hands behind his back. I wonder who Rex Holland is, he said, half to himself. You still have your theory? asked the lawyer, eyeing him keenly. Frank nodded. And you still would rather not put it into words? Much rather not, said Frank gravely. He returned to the court and glanced round for the girl, but she was not there. The rest of the afternoon's proceedings, taken up as they were with the preliminaries of the case, bored him. It was on the twelfth day of the trial that Jasper Cole stepped on to the witness stand. He was dressed in black and was paler than usual, but he took the oath in a firm voice and answered the questions which were put to him without hesitation. 
The story of Frank's quarrel with his uncle, of the forged checks, and of his own experience on the night of the crime filled the greater part of the forenoon, and it was in the afternoon when Brian Bennett, one of the most brilliant barristers of his time, stood up to cross-examine. Had you any suspicion that your employer was being robbed? I had a suspicion, replied Jasper. Did you communicate your suspicion to your employer? Jasper hesitated. No, he replied at last. Why do you hesitate? asked Bennett sharply. Because, although I did not directly communicate my suspicions, I hinted to Mr. Minnett that he should have an independent audit. So you thought the books were wrong? I did. In these circumstances, asked Bennett slowly, do you not think it was very unwise of you to touch those books yourself? When did I touch them? asked Jasper quickly. I suggest that on a certain night you came to the bank and remained in the bank by yourself, examining the ledgers on behalf of your employer, and that during that time you handled at least three books in which these falsifications were made. That is quite correct, said Jasper, after a moment's thought, but my suspicions were general and did not apply to any particular group of books. But did you not think it was dangerous? Again the hesitation. It may have been foolish, and if I had known how matters were developing, I should certainly not have touched them. You do admit that there were several periods of time, from seven in the evening until nine, and from nine-thirty until eleven-fifteen, when you were absolutely alone in the bank? That is true, said Jasper. And during those periods you could, had you wished, and had you been a forger, for example, or had you any reason for falsifying the entries, have made those falsifications? I admit there was time, said Jasper. Would you describe yourself as a friend of Frank Merrill's? Not a close friend, replied Jasper. Did you like him? I cannot say that I was fond of him, was the reply. He was a rival of yours? In what respect? Counsel shrugged his shoulders. He was very fond of Miss Nuttall. Yes. And she was fond of him? Yes. Did you not aspire to pay your addresses to Miss Nuttall? Jasper Cole looked down to the girl and they averted her eyes. Her cheeks were burning and she had a wild desire to flee from the court. If you mean that I love Miss Nuttall, said Jasper Cole in his quiet, even tone, I replied that I did. You even secured the act of support of Mr. Minnett? I never urged the matter with Mr. Minnett, said Jasper. So that if he moved on your behalf, he did so without your knowledge? Without my pre-knowledge, corrected the witness. He told me afterward that he had spoken to Miss Nuttall, and I was considerably embarrassed. I understand you were a man of curious habits, Mr. Cole. We are all people of curious habits, smiled the witness. But you in particular, you were an Orientalist, I believe? I have studied Oriental languages and customs, said Jasper shortly. Have you ever extended your study to the realm of hypnotism? I have, replied the witness. Have you ever made experiments? On animals, yes. On human beings? No, I have never made experiments on human beings. Have you also made a study of narcotics? The lawyer leaned forward over the table and looked at the witness between half-closed eyes. I have made experiments with narcotic herbs and plants, said Jasper, after a moment's hesitation. I think you should know that the career which was planned for me was that of a doctor, and I have always been very interested in the effects of narcotics. You know of a drug called Cannabis Indica? asked the counsel, consulting his paper. Yes, it is Indian hemp. Is there an infusion of Cannabis Indica to be obtained? I do not think there is, said the other. I can probably enlighten you because I see now the trend of your examination. I once told Frank Merrill, many years ago, when I was very enthusiastic, that an infusion of cannabis indica, combined with tincture of opium and hyoscine, produced certain effects. It is inclined to sap the willpower of a man or a woman who is constantly absorbing this poison in small doses, suggested the council. That is so. The council now switched off on a new tack. Do you know the East of London? Yes, slightly. Do you know Silver's Rents? Yes. Do you ever go to Silver's Rents? Yes, I go there very regularly. 
The readiness of the reply astonished both Frank and the girl. She had been feeling more and more uncomfortable as the cross-examination continued, and had a feeling that she had in some way betrayed Jasper Cole's confidence. She had listened to the cross-examination which revealed Jasper as a scientist with something approaching amazement. She had known of the laboratory, but had associated the place with those entertaining experiments that an idle dabbler in chemistry might undertake. For a moment she doubted, and searched her mind for some occasion when he had practiced his medical knowledge. Dimly she realized that there had been some such occasion, and then she remembered that it had always been Jasper Cole who had concocted the strange drafts which had so relieved the headache to which, when she was a little younger, she had been something of a martyr. Could he... She struggled hard to dismiss the thought as being unworthy of her, and now, when the object of his visits to Silver's Rents was under examination, she found her curiosity growing. Why did you go to Silver's Rents? There was no answer. I will repeat my question. With what object did you go to Silver's Rents? I decline to answer that question, said the man in the box coolly. I merely tell you that I went there frequently. And you refuse to say why? I refuse to say why, repeated the witness. The judge on the bench made a little note. I put it to you, said counsel, speaking impressively, that it was in Silver's Rents that you took on another identity. That is probably true, said the other, and the girl gasped. He was so cool, so self-possessed, so sure of himself. I suggest to you, the counsel went on, that in those rents, Jasper Cole became Rex Holland. There was a buzz of excitement, a sudden soft clamor of voices through which the usher's harsh demand for silence cut like a knife. Your suggestion is an absurd one, said Jasper without heat, and I presume that you are going to produce evidence to support so infamous a statement. What evidence I produce, said counsel with asperity, is a matter for me to decide. It is also a matter for the witness, interposed the soft voice of the judge. As you have suggested that Holland was a party to the murder, and as you are inferring that Rex Holland is Jasper Cole, it is presumed that you will call evidence to support so serious a charge. I am not prepared to call evidence, my lord, and if your lordship thinks the question should not have been put, I am willing to withdraw it. The judge nodded and turned his head to the jury. You will consider that question as not having been put, gentlemen, he said. Doubtless counsel is trying to establish the fact that one person might just as easily have been Rex Holland as another. There is no suggestion that Mr. Cole went to Silver's Rents, which I understand is in a very poor neighborhood, with any illegal intent, or that he was committing any crime or behaving in any way improperly by paying such frequent visits. There may be something in the witness's life associated with that poor house which has no bearing on the case and which he does not desire should be ventilated in this court. It happens to many of us, the judge went on, that we have associations which it would embarrass us to reveal. This little incident closed that portion of the cross-examination and counsel went on to the night of the murder. When did you come to the house, he asked. I came to the house soon after dark. Had you been in London? Yes, I walked from Bexhill. It was dark when you arrived? Yes, nearly dark. The servants had all gone out? Yes. Was Mr. Minnett pleased to see you? Yes, he had expected me earlier in the day. Did he tell you that his nephew was coming to see him? I knew that. You say he suggested that you should make yourself scarce? Yes. And as you had a headache, you went upstairs and lay down on your bed? Yes. What were you doing in Bexhill? I came down from town and got into the wrong portion of the train. A junior leaned over and whispered quickly to his leader. I see, I see, said the counsel petulantly. Your ticket was found at Bexhill. Have you ever seen Mr. Rex Holland, he asked. Never. You have never met any person of that name? Never. In this tame way, the cross-examination closed, as cross-examinations have a habit of doing. By the time the final addresses of counsel had ended, and the judge had finished a masterly summing up, there was no doubt whatever in the mind of any person in the court as to what the verdict would be. The jury was absent from the box for twenty minutes and returned a verdict of not guilty. The judge discharged Frank Merrill without comment, 
and he left the court a free but ruined man. End of chapter 12. The Man Who Came to Montreux It was two months after the great trial, on a warm day in October, when Frank Merrill stepped ashore from the big white paddle boat which had carried him across Lake Le Mans from Luzon, and handing his bag to a porter, made his way to the hotel omnibus. He looked at his watch. It pointed to a quarter to four, and May was not due to arrive until half past. He went to his hotel, washed and changed and came down to the vestibule to inquire if the instructions he had telegraphed had been carried out. May was arriving in company with Saul Arthur Mann, who was taking one of his rare holidays abroad. Frank had only seen the girl once since the day of the trial. He had come to breakfast on the following morning, and very little had been said. He was due to leave that afternoon for the continent. He had a little money, sufficient for his needs, and Jasper Cole had offered no suggestion that he would dispute the will, in so far as it affected Frank. So he had gone abroad and had idled away two months in France, Spain, and Italy, and had then made his leisurely way back to Switzerland by way of Maggiore. He had grown a little graver, was a little more set in his movements, but he bore upon his face no mark to indicate the mental agony through which he must have passed in that long, drawn-out and wearisome trial. So thought the girl as she came through the swing doors of the hotel, past the obsequious hotel servants, and greeted him in the big palm court. If she saw any change in him, he remarked a development in her which was a little short of wonderful. She was at that age when the woman is breaking through the beautiful chrysalis of girlhood. In those two months a remarkable change had come over her, a change which he could not for the moment define, for this phenomenon of development had been denied to his experience. Why, May, he said, you are quite old. She laughed, and again he noticed the change. The laugh was richer, sweeter, purer than the bubbling trouble he had known. You are not getting complimentary, are you? she asked. She was exquisitely dressed, and had that poise which few English women achieve. She had the art of wearing clothes, and from the flimsy crest of her toque to the tips of her little feet, she was all that the most exacting critic could desire. There are well-dressed women who are no more than mannequins. There are fine ladies who cannot be mistaken for anything but fine ladies, whose dresses are a horror and an abomination, and whose expressed tastes are execrable. May Nuttall was a fine lady, finely apparelled. When you have finished admiring me, Frank, she said, tell us what you have been doing. But first of all, let us have some tea. You know Mr. Mann. The little investigator, beaming in the background, took Frank's hand and shook it heartily. He was dressed in what he thought was an appropriate costume for a mountainous country. His boots were stout, the woolen stockings which covered his very thin legs were very woolen, and his knickerbocker suit was warranted to stand wear and tear. He had abandoned his top hat for a large golf cap, which was perched rakishly over one eye. Frank looked round apprehensively for Saul Arthur's alpenstock, and was relieved when he failed to discover one. The girl threw off her fur wrap and unbuttoned her gloves as the waiter placed the big silver tray on the table before her. I am afraid I have not much to tell, said Frank in answer to her question. I have just been loafing around. What is your news? What is my news? she asked. I don't think I have any, except that everything is going very smoothly in England, and oh, Frank, I am so immensely rich. He smiled. The appropriate thing would be to say that I am immensely poor, he said, but as a matter of fact I am not. I went down to Aix and won quite a lot of money. Won it? she said. He nodded with an amused little smile. You wouldn't have thought I was a gambler, would you? he asked solemnly. I don't think I am, as a matter of fact, but somehow I wanted to occupy my mind. I understand, she said quickly. Another little pause while she poured out the tea which afforded Saul Arthur Mann an opportunity of firing off fifty facts about Geneva in as many sentences. "'What has happened to Jasper?' asked Frank after a while. The girl flushed a little. "'Oh, Jasper,' she said awkwardly. "'I see him, you know. He has become more mysterious than ever, quite like one of those wicked people one reads about in sensational stories. He has a laboratory somewhere in the country, and he does quite a lot of motoring.' 
I've seen him several times at Brighton, for instance. Frank nodded slowly. I should think that he was a good driver, he said. Saw Arthur Mann looked up and met his eye with a smile which was lost upon the girl. He has been kind to me, she said hesitatingly. Does he ever speak about... She shook her head. I don't want to think about that, she said. Please don't let us talk about it. He knew she was referring to John Minnett's death and changed the conversation. A few minutes later, he had an opportunity of speaking with Mr. Mann. What is the news? he asked. Saul Arthur Mann looked round. I think we are getting near the truth, he said, dropping his voice. One of my men has had him under observation ever since the day of the trial. There is no doubt that he is really a brilliant chemist. Have you a theory? I have several, said Mr. Mann. I am perfectly satisfied that the unfortunate fellow we saw together on the occasion of our first meeting was Rex Holland's servant. I was as certain that he was poisoned by a very powerful poisoning. When your trial was on, the body was exhumed and examined, and the presence of that drug was discovered. It was the same as that employed in the case of the chauffeur. Obviously, Rex Holland is a clever chemist. I wanted to see you about that. He said at the trial that he had discussed such matters with you. Frank nodded. We used to have quite long talks about drugs, he said. I have recalled many of those conversations since the day of the trial. He even fired me with his enthusiasm, and I used to assist him in his little experiments and obtain quite a working knowledge of these particular elements. Unfortunately, I cannot remember very much, for my enthusiasm soon died, and beyond the fact that he employed hyacinth and Indian hemp, I have only the dimmest recollection of any of the constituents he employed. Saul Arthur nodded energetically. I shall have more to tell you later, perhaps, he said, but at present my inquiries are shaping quite nicely. He is going to be a difficult man to catch, because if all I believe is true, he is one of the most cold-blooded and calculating men it has ever been my lot to meet. And I have met a few, he added grimly. When he said men, Frank knew that he had meant criminals. We are probably doing him a horrible injustice, he smiled. Poor old Jasper! You are not cut out for police work, snapped Saul Arthur Mann. You've too many sympathies. I don't exactly sympathize, rejoined Frank, but I just pity him in a way. Again Mr. Mann looked round cautiously and again lowered his voice, which had risen. There is one thing I want to talk to you about. It is a rather delicate matter, Mr. Merrill, he said. Fire ahead. It is about Miss Nuttall. She has seen a lot of our friend Jasper, and after every interview she seems to grow more and more reliant upon his help. Once or twice she has been embarrassed when I have spoken about Jasper Cole and has changed the subject. Frank pursed his lips thoughtfully and a hard little look came into his eyes, which did not promise well for Jasper. So that is it, he said, and shrugged his shoulders. If she cares for him, it is not my business. But it is your business, said the other sharply. She was fond enough of you to offer to marry you. Further talk was cut short by the arrival of the girl. Their meeting at Geneva had been to some extent a chance one. She was going through to Chalmany to spend the winter and Saul Arthur Mann seized the opportunity of taking a short and pleasant holiday. Hearing that Frank was in Switzerland, she had telegraphed him to meet her. Are you staying any time in Switzerland? she asked him, as they strolled along the beautiful quay. I am going back to London tonight, he replied. Tonight? she said in surprise. He nodded. But I am staying here for two or three days, she protested. I intended also staying for two or three days, he smiled, but my business will not wait. Nevertheless, she persuaded him to stay till the morrow. They were at breakfast when the morning mail was delivered, and Frank noted that she went rapidly through the dozen letters which came to her, and she chose one for first reading. He could not help but see that that bore an English stamp, and his long acquaintance with the curious calligraphy of Jasper Cole left him in no doubt as to who was the correspondent. He saw with what eagerness she read the letter, a little look of disappointment when she turned to an inside sheet and found that it had not been filled, and his mind was made up. He had a post also, which he examined with some evidence of impatience. "'Your mail is not so nice as mine,' said the girl with a smile. "'It is not nice at all,' he grumbled. "'The one thing I wanted, and to be very truthful, May, the one inducement—' "'To stay over the night,' she added, "'was—' 
What? I have been trying to buy a house on the lake, he said, and the infernal agent at Luzon promised to write telling me whether my terms had been agreed to by his client. He looked down at the table and frowned. Saul Arthur Mann had a great and extensive knowledge of human nature. He had remarked the disappointment on Frank's face, having identified also the correspondent whose letter claimed priority of attention. He knew that Frank's anger with the house agent was very likely the expression of his anger in quite another direction. Can I send the letter on, suggested the girl. That won't help me, said Frank with a little grimace. I wanted to settle the business this week. I have it, she said. I will open the letter and telegraph to you in Paris whether the terms are accepted or not. Frank laughed. It hardly seems worth that, he said, but I should take it as awfully kind of you if you would, May. Saul Arthur Mann believed in his mind that Frank did not care tuppence whether the agent accepted the terms or not, but that he had taken this as a heaven-sent opportunity for bailing his annoyance. "'You have had quite a large mail, Miss Nuttall,' he said. "'I've only opened one, though. It is from Jasper,' she said hurriedly. Again, both men noticed the faint flush, the strange, unusual light which came to her eyes. "'And where does Jasper write from?' asked Frank, steadying his voice. He writes from England, but he was going on the continent to Holland the day he wrote, she said. It is funny to think that he is here. In Switzerland? asked Frank in surprise. Don't be silly, she laughed. No, I mean on the mainland. I mean there is no sea between us. She went crimson. It sounds thrilling, said Frank dryly. She flashed round to him. You mustn't be horrid about Jasper, she said quickly. He never speaks about you unkindly. I don't see why he should, said Frank, but let's get off a subject which is... Which is what, she challenged. Which is controversial, said Frank diplomatically. She came down to the station to see him off. As he looked out of the window, waving his farewells, he thought he had never seen a more lovely being or one more desirable. It was in the afternoon of that day which saw Frank Merrill speeding toward the Swiss frontier in Paris that Mr. Rex Holland strode into the Palace Hotel at Montreux and seated himself at a table in the restaurant. The hour was late and the room was almost deserted. Giovanni, the head waiter, recognized him and came hurriedly across the room. Ah, monsieur, he said, you are back from England. I didn't expect you till the winter sports had started. Is Paris very dull? I didn't come through Paris, said the other shortly. There are many roads leading to Switzerland. But few pleasant roads, monsieur. I have come to Montreux by all manner of ways, from Paris through Pontarlier, through Ostend, Brussels, through the Hook of Holland and Amsterdam, but Paris is the only way for the man who is flying to this beautiful land. The man at the table said nothing, scanning the menu carefully. He looked tired as one who had taken a very long journey. It may interest you to know, he said, after he had given his order and as Giovanni was turning away, that I came by the longest route. Tell me, Giovanni. Have you a man called Merrill staying at the hotel? No, monsieur, said the other. Is he a friend of yours? Mr. Rex Holland smiled. In a sense he is a friend. In a sense he is not, he said flippantly, and offered no further enlightenment, although Giovanni waited with a deferential cock of his head. Later, when he had finished his modest dinner, he strolled into the one long street of the town returning to the writing room of the hotel with a number of papers which included the visitor's list, a publication printed in English, and which, as it related the comings and goings of visitors, not only to Lausanne, Montreux, and Terretet, but also to Evian and Geneva, enjoyed a fair circulation. He sat at the table and, drawing a sheet of paper from the rack, wrote, addressed an envelope to Frank Merrill, Esquire, Hotel de France, Geneva, slipped it into the hotel pillar box, and went to bed. There's a letter here for Frank, said the girl. I wonder if it is from his agent. She examined the envelope, which bore the Montreux postmark. I should imagine it is, said Saul Arthur Mann. Well, I am going to open it anyway, said the girl. Poor Frank, he will be in a state of suspense. She tore open the envelope and took out a letter. Mr. Mann saw her face go white, and then the letter trembled in her hand. Without a word, she passed it to him, and he read, Dear Frank Merrill, said the letter, give me another month's grace and then you may tell the whole story. Yours, Rex Holland. 
Sold Arthur Mann stared at the letter with open mouth. What does it mean? asked the girl in a whisper. It means that Merrill is shielding somebody, said the other. It means... Suddenly his face lit up with excitement. The writing, he gasped. Her eyes followed his, and for a moment she did not understand. Then, with a lightning sweep of her arm, she snatched the letter from his hand and crumpled it in a ball. The writing, said Mr. Mann again. I've seen it before. It is Jasper Cole's. She looked at him steadily, though her face was white, and the hand which grasped the crumpled paper was shaking. I think you were mistaken, Mr. Mann, she said quietly. End of chapter 13「The Man Who Looked Like Frank» Saul Arthur Mann came back to England full of his news and found Frank at the little Jermyn Street Hotel where he had installed himself, and Frank listened without interruption to the story of the letter. Of course the little fellow went on, I went straight over to Montreux. The note heading was not on the paper, but I had no difficulty by comparing the qualities of papers used at the various hotels in discovering that it was written from the palace. The head waiter knew this Rex Holland, who had been a frequent visitor, had always tipped very liberally, and lived in something like style. He could not describe his patron, except that he was a young man with a very languid manner, who had arrived the previous morning from Holland, and had immediately inquired for Frank Merrill. From Holland? Are you sure it was the morning? I have a particular reason for asking, asked Frank quickly. No, it was not in the morning, now you mention it, it was in the evening. He left again the following morning by the northern train. How did he find my address? asked Frank. Obviously from the visitor's list. The waiter on duty in the writing room remembered having seen him consulting the newspaper. Now, my boy, you have to be perfectly candid with me. What do you know about Rex Holland? Frank opened his case, took out a cigarette and lit it before he replied. I know what everybody else knows about him, he said, with a hint of bitterness in his voice, and something which nobody knows but me. But, my dear fellow, said Saul Arthur Mann, laying his hand on the other's shoulder, surely you realize how important it is for you that you should tell me all you know. Frank shook his head. The time is not come, he said, and he would make no further statement. But on another matter, he was emphatic. By heaven, man! I am not going to stand by and see May ruin her life. There's something sinister in this influence which Jasper is exercising over her. You have seen it for yourself. Saul Arthur nodded. I can't understand what it is, he confessed. Of course Jasper is not a bad-looking fellow. He has perfect manners and is a charming companion. You don't think. That he is winning on his merits? Frank shook his head. No, indeed, I do not. It is difficult for me to discuss my private affairs, and you know how reluctant I am to do so, but you are also aware of what I think of May. I was hoping that we should go back to the place where we left off, and although she is kindness itself, this girl who was more to me than anything or anybody in the world, and who was prepared to marry me, and would have married me but for Jasper's machinations, was almost cold. He was walking up and down the room, and now halted in his stride and spread out his arms despairingly. What am I to do? I cannot lose her. I cannot. There was a fierceness in his tone which revealed the depth of his feeling, and Saul Arthur Mann understood. I think it is too soon to say you have lost her, Frank, he said. He had conceived a genuine liking for Frank Merrill, and the period of tribulation through which the young man had passed had heightened the respect in which he held him. We shall see the light in dark places before we go much farther, he said. There is something behind this crime, Frank, which I don't understand, but which I am certain is no mystery to you. I am sure you are shielding somebody, for what reason I am not in a position to tell, but I will get to the bottom of it. No event in the interesting life of this little man, who had spent his years in the accumulation of facts, had so distressed and piqued him as the murder of John Minnett. The case had ended where the trial had left it. Crawley, who might have offered a new aspect to the tragedy, had disappeared as completely as though the earth had swallowed him. The most strenuous efforts which the official police had made 
added to the investigations which Solar Command had conducted independently, had failed to trace the fugitive ex-sergeant of police. Obviously, he was not to be confounded with Rex Holland. He was a distinct personality working possibly in collusion, but there the association ended. It had occurred to the investigator that possibly Crawley had accompanied Rex Holland in his flight, but the most careful inquiries which he had pursued at Montreux were fruitless in this respect as in all others. To add to his bewilderment, investigations nearer at home were constantly bringing him across the track of Frank Merrill. It was as though fate had conspired to show the boy in the blackest light. Frank had been acting as secretary to his uncle, and then Jasper Cole had suddenly appeared upon the scene from nowhere in particular. The suggestion had been made somewhat vaguely that he had come from abroad, and it was certain that he arrived as a result of long negotiations which John Midden himself had conducted. They were negotiations which involved months of correspondence, no letter of which either from one or the other had Frank seen. While the trial was pending, the little man collected quite a volume of information, both from Frank and the girl. But nothing had been quite as inexplicable as this intrusion of Jasper Cole upon the scene, or the extraordinary mystery which John Minnett had made of his engagement. He had written and posted all the letters to Jasper himself, and had apparently received the replies, which he had burned at some other address of which Frank was ignorant. Jasper had come, and then one day there had been a quarrel, not between the two young men, but between Frank and his uncle. It was a singularly bitter quarrel, and again Frank refused to discuss the cause. He left the impression upon Saul Arthur's mind that he had to some extent been responsible. And here was another fact which puzzled the man who knew. Sergeant Smith, as he was then, had been to some extent responsible. It was Frank who had introduced the sergeant to Eastbourne and brought him to his uncle. But this was only one aspect of the mystery. There were others as obscure. Saul Arthur Mann went back to his bureau, and for the twentieth time gathered the considerable dossiers he had accumulated relating to the case and to the characters, and went through them systematically and carefully. He left his office near midnight, but at nine o'clock the next morning was on his way to Eastbourne. Constable Wiseman was, by good fortune, enjoying a day's holiday and was at work in his kitchen garden when Mr. Mann's car pulled up before the cottage. Wiseman received his visitor importantly, for, though the constable's prestige was regarded in official circles as having diminished as a result of the trial, it was felt by the villagers that their policeman, if he had not solved the mystery of John Minnett's death, had at least gone a long way to its solution. In the spotless room which was half kitchen and half sitting room, with its red tiled floor covered by bright matting, Mrs. Wiseman produced a well-dusted Windsor chair which he placed at Saul Arthur Mann's disposal before she politely vanished. In a very few words the investigator stated his errand, and Constable Wiseman listened in non-committal silence. When his visitor had finished, he shook his head. The only thing about the sergeant I know, he said, I have already told the chief constable who sat in that very chair, he explained. He was always a bit of a mystery, the sergeant, I mean, when he was tanked, if I may use the expression. He would tell you stories by the hour, but when he was sober you couldn't get a word out of him. His daughter only lived with him for about a fortnight. His daughter, said Mr. Mann quickly. He had a daughter, as I've already notified my superior, said Constable Wiseman gravely. Rather a pretty girl. I never saw much of her, but she was in Eastbourne off and on for about a fortnight after the sergeant came. Funny thing, I happened to know the day he arrived because the wheel of his fly came off on my beat, and I noticed the circumstances according to law and reported the same. I don't even know if she was living with him. He had a cottage down at Burlam Gap, and that is where I saw her. Yes, she was a pretty girl, he said reminiscently, one of the slim and slender kind, very dark and with a complexion like milk. But they never found her, he said. Again, Mr. Mann interrupted. You mean the police? Constable Wiseman shook his head. Oh, no, he said. They've been looking for her for years, long before Mr. Minnett was killed. Who are they? Well, several people, said the constable slowly. I happen to know that Mr. Cole wanted to find out where she was. But then he didn't start searching until weeks after she disappeared. 
It is very rum, mused Constable Wiseman, the way Mr. Cole went about it. He didn't come straight to us and ask our assistance, but he had a lot of private detectives nosing round Eastbourne. One of them happened to be a cousin of my wife's. So we got to know all about it. Cole spent a lot of money trying to trace her, and so did Mr. Minnett. Saul Arthur Mann saw a faint gleam of daylight. Mr. Minnett, too? he asked. Was he working with Mr. Cole? So far as I can find out, they were both working independent of the other. Mr. Cole and Mr. Minnett, explained Mr. Wiseman. It is what I call a mystery within a mystery, and it has never been properly cleared up. I thought something was coming out about it at the trial, but you know what a mess the lawyers made of it. It was Constable Weissman's firm conviction that Frank Merrill had escaped through the incompetence of the Crown authorities, and there were moments in his domestic circle when he was bitter and even insubordinate on the subject. Do you still think Mr. Merrill was guilty? asked Saul Arthur Mann as he took his leave of the other. I am as sure of it as I am that I am standing here, said the constable, not without a certain pride in the consistency of his view. Didn't I go into the room? Wasn't he there with the deceased? Wasn't his revolver found? Hadn't there been some jiggery-pokery with his books in London? Saul Arthur Mann smiled. There are some of us who think differently, Constable, he said, shaking hands with the implacable officer of the law. He brought back to London a few new facts to be added to his record of Sergeant Crawley, alias Smith, and on these he went painstakingly to work. As he had already explained, Saul Arthur Mann had a particularly useful relationship with Scotland Yard, and fortunately, about that time, he was on the most excellent terms with official police headquarters, for he had been able to assist them in running to earth one of the most powerful blackmailing gangs that had ever operated in Europe. His files had been drawn upon to such good purpose that the police had secured convictions against the seventeen members of the gang who were in England. He sought an interview with the chief commissioner, and that same night, accompanied by a small army of detectives, he made a systematic search of Silver's rents. The house into which Jasper Cole had been seen to enter was again raided, and again without result. The house was empty save for one room, a big room which was simply furnished with a truckle bed, a table, a chair, a lamp, and a strip of carpet. There were four rooms, two upstairs which were never used, and two on the ground floor. At the end of a passage was a kitchen, which also was empty, save for a length of bamboo ladder. From the kitchen a bolted door led onto a tiny square of yard which was separated by three walls from yards of similar dimensions to the left and right, and to the back of the premises. At the back of Silver's Rents was Royston Court, which was another cul-de-sac running parallel with Silver's Rents. Mr. Mann returned to the house and again searched the upstairs rooms, looking particularly for a trap door, for the bamboo ladder suggested some such exit. This time, however, he completely failed. Jasper Cole, he found, had made only one visit to the house since John Minnett's death. It is a curious fact, as uh, showing the localizing of interest, that Silver's rents knew nothing of what had occurred almost at its doors and though it had at its fingertips all the gossip of the docks and the Thames ironworks, it was profoundly ignorant of what was common property in Royston Court. It is even more remarkable that Saul Arthur Mann, with his squadron of detectives, should have confined their investigations to Silver's rents. The investigator was baffled and disappointed, but by the oddest of chances he was to pick up yet another thread of the minute mystery. A thread which, however, was to lead him into an even deeper maze than that which he had already and so unsuccessfully attempted to penetrate. Three days after his search of Silver's rents, business took Mr. Mann to Camden Town. To be exact, he had gone at the request of the police to Holloway Jail to see a prisoner who would turn state's evidence on a matter in which the police and Mr. Mann were equally interested. Very foolishly, he had dismissed his taxi and when he emerged from the doors there was no conveyance in sight. He decided, rather than take the trams which would have carried him to King's Cross, to walk, and since he hated main roads, he had taken a shortcut which, as he knew, would lead him into the Hampstead Road. Thus he found himself in Flower Town Road, a thoroughfare of respectable detached houses occupied by the superior industrial type. He was striding along, swinging his umbrella and humming, as was his wont, 
an unmusical rendering of a popular tune, when his attention was attracted to a sight which took his breath away and brought him to a halt. It was half past five and dull, but his eyesight was excellent, and it was impossible for him to make a mistake. The houses of Flowerton Road stand back and are separated from the sidewalk by diminutive gardens. The front doors are approached by six or seven steps, and it was on the top of one of these flights in front of an open door that the scene was enacted which brought Mr. Mann to a standstill. The characters were a young man and a girl. The girl was extremely pretty and very pale. The man was the exact double of Frank Merrill. He was dressed in a rough tweed suit and wore a soft felt hat with a fairly wide brim. But it was not the appearance of this remarkable apparition which startled the investigator. It was the attitude of the two people. The girl was evidently pleading with her companion. Solar the man was too far away to hear what she said, but he saw the young man shake himself loose from the girl. She again grasped his arm and raised her face imploringly. Mr. Mann gasped, for he saw the young man's hand come up and strike her back into the house. Then he caught hold of the door and banged it savagely, walked down the stairs and, turning, hurried away. The investigator stood as though he were rooted to the spot, and before he could recover himself the fellow had turned the corner of the road and was out of sight. Saul Arthur Mann took off his hat and wiped his forehead. All his initiative was for the moment paralyzed. He walked slowly up to the gate and hesitated. What excuse could he have for calling? If this were Frank, assuredly his own views were all wrong, and the mystery was a greater mystery still. His energies began to reawaken. He took a note of the number of the house and hurried off after the young man. When he turned the corner, his quarry had vanished. He hurried to the next corner, but without overtaking the object of his pursuit. Fortunately, at this moment, he found an empty taxi cab and hailed it. Grimm's Hotel, German Street, he directed. At least he could satisfy his mind upon one point. End of chapter 14「A Letter in the Great » Grimm's Hotel is in reality a block of flats with a restaurant attached. The restaurant is little more than a kitchen from whence meals are served to residents in their rooms. Frank's suite was on the third floor, and Mr. Men, paying his cabman, hurried into the hall, stepped into the automatic lift, pressed the button, and was deposited at Frank's door. He knocked with a sickening sense of apprehension that there would be no answer. To his delight and amazement, he heard Frank's firm step in the tiny hall of his flat, and the door was opened. Frank was in the act of dressing for dinner. "'Come in, S.A.M.,' he said cheerily, "'and tell me all the news.' He led the way back to his room and resumed the delicate task of tying his dress bow. "'How long have you been here?' asked Mr. Mann. Frank looked at him inquiringly. "'How long have I been here?' he repeated. I cannot tell you the exact time, but I have been here since a short while after lunch. Mr. Mann was bewildered and still unconvinced. What clothes did you take off? It was Frank's turn to look amazed and bewildered. Clothes? he repeated. What are you driving at, my dear chap? What suit were you wearing today? persisted Saul Arthur Mann. Frank disappeared into his dressing room and came out with a tumbled bundle which he dropped on a chair. It was the blue suit which he usually affected. Now, what is the joke? It is no joke, said the other. I could have sworn that I saw you less than half an hour ago in Camden Town. I won't pretend that I don't know where Camden Town is, smiled Frank, but I have not visited that interesting locality for many years. Saw like their man was silent. It was obvious to him that whoever was the occupant of 69 Flowerton Road, it was not Frank Merrill. Frank listened to the narrative with interest. "'You are probably mistaken. The light played you a trick, I expect,' he said. But Mr. Mann was emphatic. "'I could have taken an oath in a court that it was you,' he said. Frank stared out of the window. "'How very curious,' he mused. "'I suppose I cannot very well prosecute a man for looking like me. Poor girl!' "'Of whom are you thinking?' asked the other. I was thinking of the unfortunate woman, answered Frank. What brutes there are in the world. You gave me a terrible fright, admitted his friend. 
Frank's laugh was loud and hearty. I suppose you saw me figuring in a court charged with common assault, he said. I saw more than that, said the other gravely, and I see more than that now. Suppose you have a double, and suppose that double is working in collusion with your enemies. Frank shook his head wearily. My dear friend, he said with a little smile, I am tired of supposing things. Come and dine with me. But Mr. Mann had another engagement. Moreover, he wanted to think things out. Thinking things out was a process which brought little reward in this instance, and he went to bed that night a vexed and puzzled man. He always had his breakfast in bed at ten o'clock in the morning, for he had reached the age of habits and had fixed ten o'clock since it gave his clerks time to bring down his personal mail from the office to his private residence. It was a profitable mail. It was an exciting mail, and it contained an element of rich promise, for it included a letter from Constable Wiseman. Dear Sir, re our previous conversation, I have just come across one of the photographs of the young lady, Sergeant Smith's daughter. It was given to the private detective who was searching for her. It was given to my wife by her cousin, and I send it to you hoping it may be of some use. Yours respectfully, Peter John Wiseman. The photograph was wrapped in a piece of tissue paper and saw like their man opened it eagerly. He looked at the oblong card and gasped, for the girl who was depicted there was the girl he had seen on the steps of 69 Flowerton Road. A telephone message prepared Frank for the news, and an hour later the two men were together in the office of the Bureau. I am going along to that house to see the girl, said Saul Arthur Mann. Will you come? With all the pleasure in life, said Frank. Curiously enough, I am as eager to find her as you. I remember her very well, and one of the quarrels I had with my uncle was due to her. She had come up to the house on behalf of her father, and I thought uncle treated her rather brutally. Point number one cleared up, thought Saul Arthur Mann. Then she disappeared, Frank went on and Jasper came on the scene. There was some association between this girl and Jasper, which I have never been able to fathom. All I know is that he took a tremendous interest in her and tried to find her, and so far as I remember, he never succeeded. Mr. Mann's car was at the door, and in a few minutes they were deposited before the prim exterior of number 69. The door was opened by a girl servant who stared from Saul Arthur Mann to his companion. There is a lady living here, said Mr. Mann. He produced the photograph. This is the lady? The girl nodded, still staring at Frank. I want to see her. She's gone, said the girl. You are looking at me very intently, said Frank. Have you ever seen me before? Yes, sir, said the girl. You used to come here, or a gentleman very much like you. You are Mr. Merrill. That is my name, smiled Frank but I do not think I have ever been here before. Where has the lady gone? asked Saul Arthur. She went last night, took all her boxes and went off in a cab. Is anybody living in the house? No, sir, said the girl. How long have you been in service here? About a week, sir, replied the girl. We are friends of hers, said Saul Arthur shamelessly, and we have been asked to call to see if everything is all right. The girl hesitated, but Saul Arthur Mann, with that air of authority which he so readily assumed, swept past her and began an inspection of the house. It was plainly furnished, but the furniture was good. Apparently the spurious Mr. Merrill had plenty of money, said Saul Arthur Mann. There were no photographs or papers visible until they came to the bedroom, where, in the grate, was a torn sheet of paper bearing a few lines of fine writing, which Mr. Mann immediately annexed. Before they left, Frank again asked the girl, Was the gentleman who lived here really like me? Yes, sir, said the little slavey. Have a good look at me, said Frank humorously, and the girl stared again. Something like you, she admitted. Did he talk like me? I never heard him talk, sir, said the girl. Tell me, said Saul Arthur Mann, was he kind to his wife? A faint grin appeared on the face of the little servant. They were always rowing, she admitted. A bullying fellow he was, and she was frightened of him. Are you the police? she asked with sudden interest. Frank shook his head. No, we are not the police. 
He gave the girl half a crown and walked down the steps ahead of his companion. It is rather awkward if I have a double who bullies his wife and lives in Camden Town, he said as the car hummed back to the city office. Saul Arthur Mann was silent during the journey and only answered in monosyllables. Again in the privacy of his office, he took the torn letter and carefully pieced it together on his desk. It bore no address, and there were no affectionate preliminaries. You must get out of London. Saul Arthur Mann saw you both today. Go to the old place and await instructions. There was no signature, but across the table the two men looked at one another, for the writing was the writing of Jasper Cole. End of chapter 15「The Coming of Sergeant Smith Jasper Cole at that moment was trudging through the snow to the little chalet which May Nuttall had taken on the slope of the mountain overlooking Chamonix. The sleigh which had brought him up from the station was at the foot of the rise. May saw him from the veranda and coo-ooed a welcome. He stamped the snow from his boots and ran up the steps of the veranda to meet her. "'This is a very pleasant surprise,' she said giving him both her hands and looking at him approvingly. He had lost much of his pallor, and his face was tanned and healthy, though a little fine-drawn. It was rather a mad thing to do, wasn't it? He confessed ruefully. You are such a confirmed bachelor, Jasper, that I believe you hate doing anything outside your regular routine. Why did you come all the way from Holland to the Haute Savoie? He had followed her into the warm and cozy sitting room, and was warming his chilled fingers by the big log fire which burned on the hearth. Can you ask? I came to see you. And how are all the experiments going? She turned him to another topic in some hurry. There have been no experiments since last month, at least not the kind of experiments you mean. The one in which I have been engaged has been very successful. And what was that? she asked curiously. I will tell you one of these days, he said. He was staying at the Hotel des Alpes and hoped to be a week in Chamonix. He chatted about the weather, the early snow which had covered the valley in a mantle of white, about the tantalizing behavior of Mont Blanc, which had not been visible since May had arrived, of the early avalanches which awakened her with their thunder on the night of her arrival, of the pleasant road to Argentière, of the villages by the Col de Balme, which are buried in snow, of the sparkling ethereal green of the great glacier, of everything save that which was nearest to their thoughts and to their hearts. Jasper broke the ice when he referred to Frank's visit to Geneva. How did you know? she asked suddenly grave. Somebody told me, he said casually. Jasper, were you ever at Montreux? she asked, looking him straight in the eye. I have been to Montreux or rather to Cox, he said. That is the village on the mountain above, and one has to go through Montreux to reach it. Why do you ask? A sudden chill had fallen upon her, which she did not shake off that day or the next. They made the usual excursions together, climbed up the wooden slopes of the butt, and on the third morning of his arrival stood together in the clear dawn and watched the first pink rays of the sun striking the humped summit of Mont Blanc. Isn't it glorious, she whispered. He nodded. The serene beauty of it all, the purity, the majestic aloofness of the mountains at once depressed and exalted her, brought her nearer to the sublimity of ancient truths, cleansed her of petty fears. She turned to him unexpectedly and asked, Jasper, who killed John Minnett? He made no reply. His wistful eyes were fixed hungrily upon the glories of light and shade, of space, of inaccessibility, of purity, of coloring, of all that dawn upon which Mont Blanc comprehended. When he spoke, his voice was lowered to almost a whisper. I know that the man who killed John Minnett is alive and free, he said. Who was he? If you do not know now, you may never know, he said. There was a silence which lasted for fully five minutes, and the crimson light upon the mountaintop had paled to lemon yellow. Then she asked again, Are you directly or indirectly guilty? He shook his head. Neither directly nor indirectly, he said shortly, and the next minute she was in his arms. 
There had been no word of love between them, no tender passage, no letter which the world could not read. It was a love-making which had begun where other love-makings end, in conquest and in surrender. In this strange way, beyond all understanding, May Nuttall became engaged, and announced the fact in the briefest of letters to her friends. A fortnight later the girl arrived in England and was met at Charing Cross by Saul Arthur Mann. She was radiantly happy and bubbling over with good spirits, a picture of health and beauty. All this Mr. Mann observed with a sinking heart. He had a duty to perform, and that duty was not a pleasant one. He knew it was useless to reason with the girl. He could offer her no more than half-formed theories and suspicions, but at least he had one trump card. He debated in his mind whether he should play this, for here, too, his information was of the scantiest description. He carried his account of the girl to Frank Merrill. "'My dear Frank, she is simply infatuated,' said the little man in despair. "'Oh, if that infernal record of mine was only completed, I could convince her in a second. There is no single investigation I have ever undertaken which has been so disappointing.' "'Can nothing be done?' asked Frank. I cannot believe that it will happen. Mary Jasper, great Caesar! After all... His voice was hoarse. The hand he raised in protest shook. Saul Arthur Mann scratched his chin reflectively. Suppose you saw her, he suggested, and added a little grimly. I will see Mr. Cole at the same time. Frank hesitated. I can understand your reluctance, the little man went on but there is too much at stake to allow your finer feelings to stop you. This matter has got to be prevented at all costs. We are fighting for time. In a month, possibly less, we may have the whole of the facts in our hands. Have you found out anything about the girl in Camden Town? asked Frank. She has disappeared completely, replied the other. Every clue we have had has led nowhere. Frank dressed himself with unusual care that afternoon, and having previously telephoned and secured the girl's permission to call, he presented himself to the minute. She was, as usual, cordiality itself. "'I was rather hurt at your not calling before, Frank,' she said. "'You have come to congratulate me?' She looked at him straight in the eyes as she said this. "'You can hardly expect that, May,' he said gently, "'knowing how much you are to me and how greatly I wanted you. "'Honestly, I cannot understand it. And I can only suppose that you, whom I love better than anything in the world, and you mean more to me than any other being, share the suspicion which surrounds me like a poison cloud. Yet if I shared that suspicion, she said calmly, would I let you see me? No, Frank, I was a child when, you know. It was only a few months ago, but I believe, indeed I know, it would have been the greatest mistake I could possibly have made. I should have been a very unhappy woman for I have loved Jasper all along. She said this evenly, without any display of emotion or embarrassment. Frank, narrating the interview to Saul Arthur Mann, described the speech as almost mechanical. I hope you are going to take it nicely, she went on, that we are going to be such good friends as we always were, and that even the memory of your poor uncle's death and the ghastly trial which followed and the part that Jasper played will not spoil our friendship. But don't you see what it means to me, he burst forth. And for a second they looked at one another, and Frank divined her thoughts and winced. I know what you were thinking, he said huskily. You were thinking of all the beastly things that were said at the trial, that if I had gained you I should have gained all that I tried to gain. She went red. It was horrid of me, wasn't it, she confessed. And yet that idea came to me. One cannot control one's thoughts, Frank and you must be content to know that I believe in your innocence. There are some thoughts which flourish in one's mind like weeds, and which refuse to be uprooted. Don't blame me if I recall the lawyer's words. It was an involuntary, hateful thought. He inclined his head. There is another thought which is not involuntary, she went on, and it is because I want to retain our friendship, and I want everything to go on as usual that I am asking you one question. Your twenty-fourth birthday has come and gone. You told me that your uncle's design was to keep you unmarried until that day. You are still unmarried, and your twenty-fourth birthday has passed. What has happened? Many things have happened, he replied quietly. My uncle is dead. 
I am a rich man apart from the accident of his legacy. I could meet you on level terms. I knew nothing of this, she said quickly. He shrugged his shoulders. Didn't Jasper tell you? he asked. No, Jasper told me nothing. Frank drew a long breath. Then I can only say that until the mystery of my uncle's death is solved, you cannot know, he said. I can only repeat what I have already told you. She offered her hand. I believe you, Frank, she said, and I was wrong even to doubt you in the smallest degree. He took her hand and held it. May, he said, what is this strange fascination that Jasper has over you? For the second time in that interview, she flushed and pulled her hand back. There was nothing unusual in the fascination which Jasper exercised as she smiled, quickly recovering, almost against her will, from the little twinge of anger she felt. It is the influence which every woman has felt and which you one day will feel. He laughed bitterly. Then nothing will make you change your mind, he said. Nothing in the world, she answered emphatically. For a moment she was sorry for him, as he stood, both hands resting on a chair, his eyes on the ground, a picture of despair, and she crossed to him and slipped her arm through his. Don't take it so badly, Frank, she said softly. I am a capricious, foolish girl, I know, and I am really not worth a moment's suffering. He shook himself together, gathered up his hat, his stick, and his overcoat and offered his hand. Goodbye, he said, and good luck. In the meantime, another interview of a widely different character was taking place in the little house which Jasper Cole occupied on the Portsmouth Road. Jasper and Saul Arthur Mann had met before, but this was the first visit that the investigator had paid to the home of John Minnett's heir. Jasper was waiting at the door to greet the little man when he arrived, and had offered him a quiet but warm welcome and led the way to the beautiful study which was half laboratory, which he had built for himself since John Minnett's death. I am coming straight to the point without any beating about the bush, Mr. Cole, said the little man, depositing his bag on the side of his chair and opening it with a jerk. I will tell you frankly that I am acting on Mr. Merrill's behalf, and that I am also acting, as I believe, in the interests of justice. Your motives, at any rate, are admirable, said Jasper, pushing back the papers which littered his big library table and seated himself on the edge. You are probably aware that you are to some extent under suspicion, Mr. Cole. Under your suspicion, or the suspicion of the authorities? asked the other coolly. Under mine, said Saul Arthur Mann emphatically. I cannot speak for the authorities. In what direction does this suspicion run? He thrust his hands deep in his trousers pockets and eyed the other keenly. My first suspicion is that you are well aware as to who murdered John Minnett. Jasper Cole nodded. I am perfectly aware that he was murdered by your friend, Mr. Merrill, he said. I suggest, said Saul Arthur Mann calmly, that you know the murderer, and you know the murderer was not Frank Merrill. Jasper made no reply, and a faint smile flickered for a second at the corner of his mouth, but he gave no other sign of his inward feelings. And the other point you wish to raise, he asked. The other is a more delicate subject, since it involves a lady, said the little man. You are about to be married to Miss Nuttall. Jasper Cole nodded. You have obtained an extraordinary influence over the lady in this past few months. I hope so, said the other cheerfully. It is an influence which might have been brought about by normal methods, but it is also one, Saul Arthur leaned over and tapped the table emphatically with each word, which might be secured by a very clever chemist who had found a way of sapping the will of his victim. By the administration of drugs? asked Jasper. By the administration of drugs, repeated Saul Arthur Mann. Jasper Cole smiled. I should like to know the drug, he said. One would make a fortune to say nothing of benefiting humanity to an extraordinary degree by its employment. For example, I might give you a dose and you would tell me all that you know. I am told that your knowledge is fairly extensive, he bantered. Surely you, Mr. Mann, with your remarkable collection of information on all subjects under the sun, do not suggest that such a drug exists. On the contrary, said the man who knew, in triumph, it is known and is employed. It was known as long ago as the days of the Borgias. It was employed in France in the days of Louis the Sixteenth. 
it has been, to some extent, rediscovered and used in lunatic asylums to quiet dangerous patients. He saw the interest deepen in the other's eyes. I have never heard of that, said Jasper slowly. The only drug that is employed for that purpose is, as far as I know, bromide of potassium. Mr. Mann produced a slip of paper and read off a list of names, mostly of mental institutions in the United States of America and in Germany. Oh, that drug, said Jasper Cole contemptuously. I know the use to which that is put. There was an article on the subject in the British Medical Journal three months ago. It is a modified kind of twilight sleep, hyacinth and morphia. I'm afraid, Mr. Mann, he went on, you have come on a fruitless errand, and speaking as a humble student of science, I may suggest without offense that your theories are wholly fantastic. Then I will put another suggestion to you, Mr. Cole, said the little man without resentment, and to me this constitutes the chief reason why you should not marry the lady whose confidence I enjoy and who, I feel sure, will be influenced by my advice. And what is that? asked Jasper. It affects your own character, and it is in consequence a very embarrassing matter for me to discuss, said the little man. Again the other favored him with that inscrutable smile of his. My moral character, I presume, is now being assailed, he said flippantly. Please go on. You promise to be interesting. You were in Holland a short time ago. Does Miss Nuttall know this? Jasper nodded. She is well aware of the fact. You were in Holland with a lady, accused Mr. Mann slowly. Is Miss Nuttall well aware of this fact, too? Jasper slipped from the table and stood upright. Through his narrow lids he looked down upon his accuser. Is that all you know? he asked softly. Not all, but one of the things I know, retorted the other. You were seen in her company. She was staying in the same hotel with you as Mrs. Cole. Jasper nodded. You will excuse me if I decline to discuss the matter, he said. Suppose I ask Miss Nuttall to discuss it, challenged the little man. You are a master of your own actions, said Jasper Cole quickly, and I dare say, if you regard it as expedient, you will tell her, but I can promise you that whether you tell her or not, I shall marry Miss Nuttall. With this he ushered his visitor to the door, and hardly waited for the car to drive off before he had shut that door behind him. Late that night the two friends foregathered and exchanged their experiences. I am sure there is something very wrong indeed, said Frank emphatically. She was not herself. She spoke mechanically, almost as though she were reciting a lesson. You had the feeling that she was connected by wires with somebody who was dictating her every word and action. It is damnable, man. What can we do? We must prevent the marriage, said the little man quietly, and employ every means that opportunity suggests to that purpose. Make no mistake, he said emphatically. Cole will stop at nothing. His attitude was one big bluff. He knows that I have beaten him. It was only by luck that I found out about the woman in Holland. I got my agent to examine the hotel register, and there it was, without any attempt at disguise. Mr. and Mrs. Cole of London. The thing to do is to see May at once, said Frank. I put all the facts before her, though I hate the idea. It seems like sneaking. Sneaking? exploded Saul Arthur Mann. What nonsense you talk. You are too full of scruples, my friend, for this work. I will see her tomorrow. I will go with you, said Frank, after a moment's thought. I have no wish to escape my responsibility in the matter. She will probably hate me for my interference, but I have reached beyond the point where I care, so long as she can be saved. It was agreed that they should meet one another at the office in the morning and make their way together. Remember this, said Mann seriously, before they parted that if Cole finds the game is up, he will stop at nothing. Do you think we ought to take precautions? asked Frank. Honestly, I do, confess the other. I don't think we can get the men from the yard, but there is a very excellent agency which sometimes works for me, and they can provide a guard for the girl. I wish you would get in touch with them, said Frank earnestly. I am worried sick over this business. She ought never to be left out of their sight. I will see if I can have a talk to her maid, so that we may know whenever she is going out. There ought to be a man on a motorcycle always waiting about the Savoy to follow her wherever she goes. They parted at the entrance of the bureau, Saul Arthur Mann returning to telephone the necessary instructions. 
how necessary they were was proved that very night. At nine o'clock, May was sitting down to a solitary dinner when a telegram was delivered to her. It was from the chief of the little mission in which she had been interested and ran, Very urgent. Have something of the greatest importance to tell you. It was signed with the name of the matron of the mission, and leaving her dinner untouched, May only delayed long enough to change her dress before she was speeding in a taxi eastward. She arrived at the hall, which was the headquarters of the mission, to find it in darkness. A man who was evidently a new helper was waiting in the doorway and addressed her. You are Miss Nuttall, aren't you? I thought so. The matron has gone down to Silver's rents, and she has asked me to go along with you. The girl dismissed the taxi, and in company with her guide threaded the narrow tangle of streets between the mission and Silver's rents. She was halfway along one of the ill-lighted thoroughfares, when she noticed that drawn up by the side of the road was a big handsome motor car, and she wondered what had brought this evidence of luxurious living to the mean streets of Canning Town. She was not left in doubt very long, for as she came up to the lights and was shielding her eyes from their glare, her arms were tightly grasped, a shawl was thrown over her head, and she was lifted and thrust into the car's interior. A hand gripped her throat. "'You scream and I will kill you!' hissed a voice in her ear. At that moment the car started, and the girl, with a scream which was strangled in her throat, fell swooning back on the seat. May recovered consciousness to find the car still rushing forward in the dark, and the hand of her captor still resting at her throat. "'You be a sensible girl,' said a muffled voice, "'and do as you're told, and no harm will come to you.' It was too dark to see his face, and it was evident that even if there were light the face was so well concealed that she could not recognize the speaker. Then she remembered that this man, who had acted as her guide, had been careful to keep in the shadow of whatever light there was while he was conducting her, as he said, to the matron. "'Where are you taking me?' she asked. "'You'll know in time,' was the noncommittal answer. It was a wild night. Rain splashed against the windows of the car, and she could hear the wind howling above the noise of the engines. They were evidently going into the country, for now and again, by the light of the headlamps, she glimpsed hedges and trees which flashed past. Her captor suddenly let down one of the windows and leaned out, giving some instructions to the driver. What they were, she guessed, for the lights were suddenly switched off and the car ran in darkness. The girl was in a panic for all her bold showing. She knew that this desperate man was fearless of consequence, and that if her death would achieve his ends and the ends of his partners, her life was in imminent peril. What were those ends, she wondered? Were these the same men who had done to death John Minnett? Who are you, she asked. There was a little chuckling laugh. You'll know soon enough. The words were hardly out of his mouth when there was a terrific crash. The car stopped suddenly and canted over. The girl was jerked forward to her knees. Every pane of glass in the car was smashed, and it was clear from the angle at which it lay that irremediable damage had been done. The man scrambled up, kicked open the door, and jumped out. Level crossing gate, sir, said the voice of the chauffeur. I've broken my wrist. With the disappearance of her captor, the girl had felt for the fastening of the opposite door and had turned it. To her delight, it opened smoothly and had evidently been unaffected by the jam. She stepped out to the road, trembling in every limb. She felt, rather than saw, the level crossing gate, and knew that at one side was a swing gate for passengers. She reached this when her abductor discovered her flight. "'Come back!' he cried hoarsely. She heard a roar and saw a flashing of lights and fled across the line just as an express train came flying northward. It missed her by inches, and the force of the wind threw her to the ground. She scrambled up, stumbled across the remaining rails, and reaching the gate opposite, fled down the dark road. She had gained just that much time which the train took in passing. She ran blindly along the dark road, slipping and stumbling in the mud, and she heard her pursuer squelching through the mud in the rear. The wind flew her hair awry. The rain beat down upon her face, but she stumbled on. Suddenly she slipped and fell, and as she struggled to her feet, the heavy hand of her pursuer fell upon her shoulder, and she screamed aloud. None of that, said the voice, and his hand covered her mouth. At that moment a bright light enveloped the two, a light so intensely, dazzlingly white, 
so unexpected that it hit the girl almost like a blow. It came from somewhere not two yards away, and the man released his hold upon the girl and stared at the light. Hello, said a voice from the darkness. What's the game? She was behind the man and could not see his face. All that she knew was that here was help, unexpected, heaven sent, and she strove to recover her breath and her speech. It's all right, growled the man. She's a lunatic and I'm taking her to the asylum. Suddenly the light was pushed forward to the man's face and a heavy hand was laid upon his shoulder. You are, are you, said the other. Well, I'm going to take you to a lunatic asylum, Sergeant Smith, or Crawley, or whatever your name is. You know me. My name's Wiseman. For a moment, the man stood as though petrified, and then, with a sudden jerk, he wrenched his hand free and sprang at the policeman with a wild yell of rage, and in a second both men were rolling over in the darkness. Constable Wiseman was no child, but he had lost his initial advantage, and by the time he got to his feet and had found his electric torch, Crawley had vanished. End of chapter 16— The Man Called Merrill — If wise men did not think you were a murderer, I should regard him as an intelligent being, said Saul Arthur Mann. — Have they found Crawley? asked Frank. — No, he got away. The chauffeur and the car were hired from a West End garage with this story of a lunatic who had to be removed to an asylum, and apparently Crawley, or Smith, was the man who hired them. He even paid a little extra for the damage which the alleged lunatic might do the car. The chauffeur says that he had some doubt, and had intended to inform the police after he had arrived at his destination. As a matter of fact, they were just outside Eastbourne when the accident occurred. The man who knew paused. Where did he say he was taking her? he asked Frank. He was told to drive into Eastbourne, where more detailed instructions would be given to him. The police have confirmed this story, and he has been released. I have just come from May, said Frank. She looks none the worse for her exciting adventure. I hope you have arranged to have her guarded? Saul Arthur Mann nodded. It will be the last adventure of that kind our friend will attempt, he said. Still, this enlightens us a little. We know that Mr. X. Holland has an accomplice, and that accomplice is Sergeant Smith, so we may presume that they were both in the murder. Constable Wiseman has been suitably rewarded, as he well deserves, said Frank heartily. You bear no malice, smiled Saul Arthur Mann. Frank laughed and shook his head. How can one? he asked simply. May had another visitor. Jasper Cole came hurriedly to London at the first intimation of the outrage, but was reassured by the girl's appearance. It was awfully thrilling, she said, but really I am not greatly distressed. In fact, I think I look less tired than you. He nodded. That is very possible. I did not go to bed until very late this morning, he said. I was so engrossed in my research work that I did not realize it was morning until they brought me my tea. You haven't been in bed all night, she said, shocked, and shook her head reprovingly. That is one of your habits of life which will have to be changed, she warned him. Jasper Cole did not dismiss her unpleasant experience as lightly as she. I wonder what the object of it all was, he said, and why they took you back to Eastbourne. I think we shall find that the headquarters of this infernal combination is somewhere in Sussex. Mr. Mann doesn't think so, she said but believes that the car was to be met by another at Eastbourne and I was to be transferred. He says that the idea of taking me there was to throw the police off the scent. She shivered. It wasn't a nice experience, she confessed. The interview took place in the afternoon and was some two hours after Frank had interviewed the girl. Saul like the man had gone to Eastbourne to bring her back. Jasper had arranged to spend the night in town and had booked two stalls at the Hippodrome. She had told Saul Arthur Mann this, in accordance with her promise to keep him informed as to her movements, and she was therefore surprised when, half an hour later, a little investigator presented himself. She met him in the presence of her fiancé, and it was clear to Jasper what Saul Arthur Mann's intentions were. I don't want to make myself a nuisance, he said, but before we go any further, Miss Nuttall, there are certain matters on which you ought to be informed. 
I have every reason to believe that I know who was responsible for the outrage of last night, and I do not intend risking a repetition. Who do you think was responsible? asked the girl quietly. I honestly believe that the author is in this room, was a startling response. You mean me? asked Jasper Cole angrily. I mean you, Mr. Cole. I believe that you are the man who planned the coup and that you are its sole author, said the other. The girl stared at him in astonishment. You surely do not mean what you say. I mean that Mr. Cole has every reason for wishing to marry you, he said. What that reason is I do not know completely, but I shall discover. I am satisfied, he went on slowly, that Mr. Cole is already married. She looked from one to the other. Already married? repeated Jasper. If he is not already married, said Saul Arthur Mann bluntly, then I have been indiscreet. The only thing I can tell you is that your fiancé has been traveling on the continent with a lady who describes herself as Mrs. Cole. Jasper said nothing for a moment, but looked at the other oddly and thoughtfully. I understand, Mr. Mann, he said at length, that you collect facts as other people collect postage stamps. Saul Arthur Mann bristled. You may carry this off, sir, he began, if you can. Let me speak, said Jasper Cole, raising his voice. I want to ask you this. Have you a complete record of John Minnett's life? I know it so well, said Saul Arthur Mann emphatically, that I could repeat his history word for word. Will you sit down, May? said Jasper, taking the girl's hand in his and gently forcing her to a chair. We are going to put Mr. Mann's memory to the test. Do you seriously mean that you want me to repeat that history? asked the other suspiciously. I mean just that, said Jasper, and drew up a chair for his unpleasant visitor. The record of John Minnett's life came trippingly from Mann's tongue. He knew to an extraordinary extent the details of that strange and wild career. In 1892, said the investigator, continuing his narrative, he was married at St. Bride's Church, Port Elizabeth, to Agnes Gertrude Cole. Cole, murmured Jasper. The little man looked at him with open mouth. Cole, good Lord, you are... I am his son, said Jasper quietly. I am one of his two children. Your information is that there was one. As a matter of fact, there were two. My mother left my father with one of the greatest scoundrels that has ever lived. He took her to Australia, where my sister was born six months after she had left John Minnett. There her friend deserted her, and she worked for seven years as a kitchen maid in Melbourne in order to save up enough money to bring us to Cape Town. My mother opened a tea shop off Adderley Street and earned enough to educate me and my sister. It was there she met Crawley, and Crawley promised to use his influence with my father to bring about a reconciliation for her children's sake. I do not know what was the result of his attempt, but I gather it was unsuccessful, and things went on very much as they were before. Then one day, when I was still at the South African College, my mother went home, taking my sister with her. I have reason to believe that Crawley was responsible for her sailing and that he met them on landing. All that I knew was that from that day my mother disappeared. She had left me a sum of money to continue my studies, but after eight months had passed and no word had come from her, I decided to go on to England. I have since learned what had happened. My mother had been seized with a stroke and had been conveyed to the workhouse infirmary by Crawley, who had left her there and had taken my sister, who apparently he passed off as his own daughter. I did not know this at the time, but being well aware of my father's identity, I wrote to him, asking him for help to discover my mother. He answered, telling me that my mother was dead, that Crawley had told him so, and that there was no trace of Marguerite, my sister. We exchanged a good many letters, and then my father asked me to come and act as the secretary and assist him in his search for Marguerite. What he did not know was that Crawley's alleged daughter, whom he had not seen, was the girl for whom he was seeking. I fell into the new life and found John Minnett, I can scarcely call him father, much more bearable than I expected, and then one day I found my mother. You found your mother? said Saul Arthur Mann, a light dawning upon him. Your persistent search of the little house in Silver's rents produced nothing, he smiled. 
Had you taken the bamboo ladder and crossed the yard at the back of the house into another yard, then through the door, you would have come to number 16 Royston Court, and you would have been considerably surprised to find an interior much more luxurious than you would have expected in that quarter. In Royston Court, they spoke of number 16 as the house with the nurses, because there were always three nurses on duty, and nobody ever saw the inside of the house but themselves. There you would have found my mother, bedridden, and indeed so ill that the doctors who saw her would not allow her to be moved from the house. I furnished this hovel piece by piece, generally at night, because I did not want to excite the curiosity of the people in the court, nor did I wish this matter to reach the ears of John Minnett. I felt that while I retained his friendship and his confidence, there was at least a chance of his reconciliation with my mother, and that, before all things, she desired. It was not to be, he said sadly. John Minnett was struck down at the moment my plan seemed as though they were going to result in complete success. Strangely enough, with his death, my mother made an extraordinary recovery, and I was able to move her to the continent. She had always wanted to see Holland, France, and at this moment, he turned to the girl with a smile, she is in the chalet which you occupied during your holiday. Mr. Mann was dumbfounded. All his pet theories had gone by the board. But what of your sister? he asked at last. A black look gathered in Jasper Cole's face. My sister's whereabouts are known to me now, he said shortly. For some time she lived in Camden Town at number 69 Flowerton Road. At the present moment she is nearer and is watched night and day, almost as carefully as Mr. Mann's agents are watching you. He smiled again at the girl. Watching me? she said startled. Saul Arthur Mann went red. It was my idea, he said stiffly. And a very excellent one, agreed Jasper. But unfortunately, you appointed your guards too late. Mr. Mann went back to his office, his brain in a whirl, yet such was his habit that he did not allow himself to speculate upon the new and amazing situation until he had carefully jotted down every new fact he had collected. It was astounding that he had overlooked the connection between Jasper Cole and John Minnett's wife. His labors did not cease until eleven o'clock, and he was preparing to go home when the commissionaire who acted as caretaker came to tell him that a lady wished to see him. A lady? At this hour of the night? said Mr. Mann, perturbed. Tell her to come in the morning. I have told her that, sir, but she insists upon seeing you tonight. What is her name? Mrs. Merrill, said the commissionaire. Saul Arthur Mann collapsed into his chair. Show her up, he said feebly. He had no difficulty in recognizing the girl who came timidly into the room as the original of the photograph which had been sent to him by Constable Wiseman. She was plainly dressed and wore no ornament, and she was undeniably pretty, but there was about her a furtiveness and a nervous indecision which spoke of her apprehension. Sit down, said Mr. Mann kindly. What do you want me to do for you? I am Mrs. Merrill, she said timidly. So the commissioner said, replied the little man, you are nervous about something? Oh, I am so frightened, said the girl with a shudder. If he knows I have been here, he'll... You have nothing to be frightened about. Just sit here for one moment. He went into the next room, which had a branch telephone connection, and called up May. She was out, and he left an urgent message that she was to come, bringing Jasper with her as soon as she returned. When he got back to his office, he found the girl as he had left her, sitting on the edge of a big armchair, plucking nervously at her handkerchief. I have heard about you, she said. He mentioned you once, before we went to that Sussex cottage with Mr. Crawley. They were going to bring another lady, and I was to look after her. But he... Who is he? asked Mr. Mann. My husband, said the girl. How long have you been married? demanded the little man. I ran away with him a long time ago, she said. It has been an awful life. It was Mr. Crawley's idea. He told me that if I married Mr. Merrill, he would take me to see my mother and Jasper. But he was so cruel, she shuddered again. We've been living in furnished houses all over the country, and I had been alone most of the time, and he would not let me go out by myself or do anything. 
She spoke in a subdued, monotonous tone that betrayed the nearness of a bad, nervous breakdown. What does your husband call himself? Why, Frank Merrill, said the girl in astonishment. That's his name. Mr. Crawley always told me his name was Merrill, isn't it? Mr. Mann shook his head. My poor girl, he said sympathetically, I am afraid you have been grossly deceived. The man you married as Merrill is an imposter. An imposter? she faltered. Mr. Mann nodded. He has taken a good man's name, and I am afraid has committed abominable crimes in that man's name, said the investigator gently. I hope we shall be able to rid you and the world of a great villain. Still, she stared uncomprehendingly. He has always been a liar, she said slowly. He lied naturally and acted things so well that you believed him. He told me things which I know aren't true. He told me my brother was dead, but I saw his name in the paper the other day, and that is why I came to you. Do you know Jasper? She was as naive and unsophisticated as a schoolgirl and it made the little man's heart ache to hear the plaintive monotony of tone and see the trembling lip. I promise you that you will meet your brother, he said. I have run away from Frank, she said suddenly. Isn't that a wicked thing to do? I could not stand it. He struck me again yesterday, and he pretends to be a gentleman. My mother used to say that no gentleman ever treats a woman badly, but Frank does. Nobody shall treat you badly any more, said Mr. Mann. I hate him, she went on with sudden vehemence. He sneers and says he's going to get another wife and... Oh! He saw her hands go up to her face and saw her staring eyes turn to the door in a fright. Frank Merrill stood in the doorway and looked at her without recognition. I am sorry, he said. You have a visitor? Come in, said Mr. Mann. I'm awfully glad you called. The girl had risen to her feet and was shrinking back to the wall. Do you know this lady? Frank looked at her keenly. Why, yes, that's Sergeant Smith's daughter, he said, and he smiled. Where on earth have you been? Don't touch me, she breathed, and put her hands before her, warding him off. He looked at her in astonishment, and from her to man. Then he looked back at the girl, his brow wrinkled in perplexity. This girl, said Mr. Mann, thinks she is your wife. My wife? said Frank, and looked again at her. Is this a bad joke or something? Do you say that I am your husband? he asked. She did not speak, but nodded slowly. He sat down in a chair and whistled. This rather complicates matters, he said blankly, but perhaps you can explain. I only know what the girl has told me, said Mr. Mann, shaking his head. I am afraid there is a terrible mistake here. Frank turned to the girl. But did your husband look like me? She nodded. And did he call himself Frank Merrill? Again she nodded. Where is he now? She nodded, this time at him. But great heaven, said Frank, with a gesture of despair, you do not suggest that I am the man? You are the man, said the girl. Again Frank looked appealingly at his friend and saw like their man saw dismay and laughter in his eyes. I don't know what I can do, he said. Perhaps if you left me alone with her for a minute. Don't, don't, she breathed. Don't leave me alone with him. Stay here. And where have you come from now, asked Frank. From the house where you took me. You struck me yesterday, she went on inconsequently. Frank laughed. I am not only married, but I am a wife beater, apparently, he said desperately. Now what can I do? I think the best thing that can be done is for this lady to tell us where she lives and I will take her back and confront her husband. I won't go with you, cried the girl. I won't, I won't. You said you'd look after me, Mr. Mann. You promised. The little investigator saw that she was distraught to a point where a collapse was imminent. This gentleman will look after you also, he said encouragingly. He is as anxious to save you from your husband as anybody. I will not go, she cried. If that man touches me, and she pointed to Frank, I'll scream. Again came the tap at the door, and Frank looked round. More visitors? he asked. It is all right, said Saul Arthur Man. There's a lady and a gentleman to see me, isn't there? he asked the commissionaire. Show them in. May came first, saw the little tableau, and stopped, knowing instinctively all that it portended. 
Jasper followed her. The girl who had been watching Frank shifted her eyes for a moment to the visitors, and at sight of Jasper flung across the room. In an instant her brother's arms were around her, and she was sobbing on his breast. Am I entitled to ask what all this means? asked Frank quietly. I am sure you will overlook my natural irritation, but I have suffered so much and I have been the victim of so many surprises that I do not feel inclined to accept all the shocks which fate sends me in a spirit of joyful resignation. Perhaps you will be good enough to elucidate this new mystery. Is everybody mad, or am I the sole sufferer? There is no mystery about it, said Jasper, still holding the girl. I think you know this lady? I have never met her before in my life, said Frank, but she persists in regarding me as her husband for some reason. Is this a new scheme of yours, Jasper? I think you know this lady, said Jasper Cole again. Frank shrugged his shoulders. You are almost monotonous. I repeat that I have never seen her before. Then I will explain to you, said Jasper. He put the girl gently from him for a moment and turned and whispered something to May. Together they passed out of the room. You were confidential secretary to John Minnett for some time, Merrill, and in that capacity you made several discoveries. The most remarkable discovery was made when Sergeant Smith came to blackmail my father. Oh, don't pretend you didn't know that John Minnett was my father, he said in answer to the look of amazement on Frank Merrill's face. Smith took you into his confidence, and you married his alleged daughter. John Minnett discovered this fact, not that he was aware that it was his own daughter, or that he thought that your association with my sister was any more than an intrigue beneath the dignity of his nephew. You did not think the time was ripe to spring a son-in-law upon him, and so you waited until you had seen his will. In that will he made no mention of a daughter, because the child had been born after his wife had left him, and he refused to recognize his paternity. Later, in some doubt as to whether he was doing an injustice to what might have been his own child, he endeavored to find her. Had you known of these investigations, you could have helped considerably, but as it happened, you did not. You married her because you thought you would get a share of John Minnett's millions, and when you found your plan had miscarried, you planned an act of bigamy in order to secure a portion of Mr. Minnett's fortune, which you knew would be considerable. He turned to Saul Arthur Mann. Do you think I have not been very energetic in pursuing my inquiries as to who killed John Minnett? There is the explanation of my tolerance. He pointed his finger at Frank. This man is the husband of my sister. To ruin him would have meant involving her in that ruin. For a time I thought they were happily married. It was only recently that I have discovered the truth. Frank shook his head. I don't know whether to laugh or cry, he said. I have certainly not heard... You will hear more, said Jasper Cole. I will tell you how the murder was committed and who was the mysterious Rex Holland. Your father was a forger. That is known. You also have been forging signatures since you were a boy. You were Rex Holland. You came to Eastbourne on the night of the murder, and by an ingenious device you secured evidence in your favor in advance. Pretending to have lost your ticket, you allowed station officials to search you and to testify that you had no weapon. You were dropped at the gate of my father's house, and as soon as the cab driver had disappeared, you made your way to where you had hidden your car in a field at a short distance from the house. You had arrived there earlier in the evening and had made your way across the metals to Polgate Junction, where you joined the train. As you had taken the precaution to have your return ticket clipped in London, your trick was not discovered. You had regained your car and drove up to the house ten minutes after you had been seen to disappear through the gateway. From your car you had taken the revolver, and with that revolver you murdered my father. In order to shield yourself, you threw suspicion on me and made friends with one of the shrewdest men. He inclined his head toward the speechless Mr. Mann, and through him conveyed those suspicions to authoritative quarters. It was you who, having said farewell to Miss Nuttall in Geneva, reappeared the same evening at Montreux and wrote a note forging my handwriting. It was you who left a torn sheet of paper in the room at number 69 Flowerton Road, also in your writing. You have never moved a step but that I have followed you. My agents have been with you day and night ever since the day of the murder. I have waited my time, and that has come now. Frank heaved a long sigh and took up his hat. 
Tomorrow morning I shall have a story to tell, he said. You are an excellent actor, said Jasper, and an excellent liar, but you have never deceived me. He flung open the door. There is your road. You have twenty thousand pounds which my father left you. You have some fifty-five thousand pounds which you buried on the night of the murder. You remember the gardener's trowel in the car, he said, turning to man. I give you twenty-four hours to leave England. We cannot try you for the murder of John Minnett. You can still be tried for the murder of your unfortunate servants. Frank Merrill made no movement toward the door. He walked over to the other end of the room and stood with his back to them. Then he turned. Sometimes, he said, I feel that it isn't worthwhile going on. It has been rather a strain, all this. Jasper Cole sprang toward him and caught him as he fell. They laid him down, and Saul Arthur Mann called urgently on the telephone for a doctor, but Frank Merrill was dead. I knew, said Constable Wiseman, when the story came to him. End of chapter 17 End of the Man Who Knew by Edgar Wallace